for everybody to make sure everybody can get into the conference as accessible as possible. Um, please also note that the session will be recorded um, and may be shared via, via the website and social media. And if anybody has any problems throughout the day, we have an admin in each of the rooms. But if you still can't get hold of anybody, please do email the info at WATF um, network email address, which is given on the screen there. So I think that's all of the technical bits that um, I need to do for the day. I've already mentioned John's wonderful illustrations, which are going up there. And in terms of the rooms for the parallel sessions, so we'll switch to um, different rooms, which you should have links for in the um, documents and the emails that you've been sent. This morning we start off with a keynote conversation, um, very topical related to COVID and water efficiency. So of course for 2020 the conference was supposed to take place um, at the University of the West of England's French A campus, um, home to the Centre for Water Communities and Resilience. But due to the pandemic we're all here online joining virtually from our homes and offices um, as in the UK, large scale gatherings are still not permitted. Um, unfortunately, due to keeping the R number down um, or less, you know, around and less than one. And as the, the tagline currently goes, we have to stay alert, control the virus and save lives. So in a very short space of time, our home, work and leisure um, and time, time and environments have changed beyond recognition with people, things doing very different differently to how they were at the start of the year. Um, this has had implications for a number of sectors with much focus on NHS and key worker roles, including supermarket staff, bus drivers um, and other roles that keep our society functioning. So in the background are utility providers, which of course includes the water sector and the water industry, have similarly been working to ensure that resources that support everyday practices are literally on tap to help us reduce um, the risk and keep that R down. Hand washing has never been so far up the daily agenda in a developed country and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the keynote conversation this morning. Um, we're also going to be talking about other things during the conference so the parallel sessions will run through quite a diversity of topics as I mentioned earlier um, and then in this afternoon or sorry not this afternoon <laughs> after the the break um, because we're on a half day today We've got a special session from the Water Reuse Technical Committee of WATF on Resilience and Integrated Water Management. Um, then we'll go into a, a nice live launch from the, the West Country Rivers Trust and close down the conference somewhere between 12.45 and 1 o'clock. So I do look forward to engaging with everybody throughout the day. Um, as I said, please do interact through the chat. Um, put your hands up if you've got that team function. Um, and as Kemi introduced um, everybody really nicely yesterday doing that um, in the conference, I'd like to like us to replicate that. Unfortunately, I don't have that function on my version of Teams, so I can't do that. But I would love everybody just to put their hands up and give everybody a virtual wave or say hello or a high five or something in the comments, just so that we all know everybody's there because it's a little bit weird doing it virtually and not be able to see everybody's smiling faces in the rooms in front of us. I hope people are putting up some hands, putting some hellos or some high fives in the chat box. Yeah, we've got a few hellos coming in there. Brilliant. Great, so we know that people are there. Hello, everybody, and welcome to day two of the conference. So I'd just like to hand over to Chad for any additional comments or thoughts for the day. I think Chad may be having some trouble joining us. Kemi, is there anything you would like to add at all? No, just to say good morning and thank you again for joining us. Thanks for yesterday and hopefully today is going to be equally interesting, engaging. I can see lots of conversations already, so enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Kemi. Um, I see Chad has now managed to get into the room, so hopefully 
Um, I just. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And good morning, Chad. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Good morning. Welcome to day two of the Water Efficiency Network Conference. Good morning. Thank you for the invite. Hello. So, Chad, are we going to turn on our video feed so that people can see little tiny pictures of us talking to them, or are we going to try and restrict our bandwidth? Well, I'll try the, uh, the video. We'll see how we go. I put on a smart jumper, especially. <laughs> Brilliant. So this, I'm this, not gonna... this is me dressing up. I'm now going to hand over to Chad and Patrick, um, and they're going to kick off the conversation to, which is COVID and water efficiency. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Patrick and I agreed uh, when we discussed what we would do uh, today. This I would start with uh, five or six minutes, uh, starting with a global perspective, and then uh, we'll we'll quickly zoom in to uh, what all this might mean or could mean or is meaning for England uh, and indeed the Southwest. So without further ado, I'd like to share my screen with you or Eleanor's doing it for me. That's fantastic. Thank you, Eleanor. So the session is COVID-19 and water efficiency, and we will arc from the global down to the local uh, with that thematic in mind. Uh, next slide, please. introductory frame and comments are based on a paper I published earlier this year in Water International with a number of colleagues, all of whom are associated with a global research network called Household Water Insecurity Experiences. Next slide, please. We've been doing work for several years in uh, two or three dozen locations in the Global South looking at the household scale water insecurity multi-dimensionally and as it happens built up the world's largest data set looking at water related personal hygiene so when COVID-19 rolled around uh, early in the year we suddenly found ourselves very much on the spot in terms of media interest and um, immediate uh, application and relevance so a number of papers came out but including the one I just shared with you, and I'll give you details about how to how to find that your, uh, yourself if you wish at the end of the presentation. But it boils down to this. We're constantly told that hand wash is, is critical to fighting COVID-19. But what then does this mean for the large numbers of people around the world who do not have sufficient reliable water supplies? We know that more than one in five of the world's population does not enjoy safe access to reliable water. And most, but not all, as Jess Cook pointed out yesterday, of these people live in the global south. Next slide, please. We published some data, and this is the key figure from the paper that I'm talking about right now, uh, that breaks down what two dozen study sites reported by way of uh, hand washing related difficulty associated with water. In other words, we asked these households in the last 30 days, how frequently have you encountered water related difficulties in washing your hands? This is the standard water and sanitation for health question, and it was in included within our basic um, survey module. The length of the black bar shows prevalence. The longer the bar, the higher the prevalence. So you can see, for example, in our study area in the Punjab in Pakistan, 83% of respondents reported uh, that in the last 30 days they had experienced the difficulty of washing their hands because they didn't have water. Similarly, in rural Uganda, 54%. In uh, the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, 54%. In uh, island Indonesia, 59%. But also some very low prevalent reporting in Honda, Colombia, uh, Merida, Mexico, uh, Lagos, Nigeria, and other locations. So we know from our survey data that the picture is very mixed. Although the headline finding is that there's a huge problem with accessing safe and reliable water for practicing hand washing, we know that the picture is variable. Next slide, please. But we also know that 
uh, higher income countries are affected as well. And this uh, uh, reflects some comments that Jess Cook made yesterday in her keynote conversation presentation. We know that in 2015, an estimated people in Europe and North America lack piped water at home. We know that during the COVID crisis, well, actually, it's over 100 US cities and states now have had to uh, legally stop or halt water shutoffs, which are common in North America as a function of unpaid bills. Of course, in England and Wales, that is not the case uh, as a function of regulatory and legal change that took place in the 1990s. But in the United States in particular, it's been necessary for state governments to specifically proscribe cutting off water or non-payment of bills during the health and economic crisis caused by COVID-19. We also know that the highest shutoff rates are concentrated in southern states, including Louisiana and the others, and specifically uh, amongst the Black, Hispanic and Native American population. Next slide, please. And then uh, just referencing something else Jeff pointed out to us uh, yesterday, she talked about appliance poverty or appliance deprivation, the tendency or prevalence for poorer households in the United Kingdom to have fewer appliances with which they can practice hygiene, uh, personal hygiene, clothing hygiene, uh, household hygiene. My colleague Katie Meehan at uh, University College London refers to this as plumbing poverty and she published a paper on this in the Annals of the Association of American Geography last year from which this data is excerpted. So almost half a million households in the United States experience what uh, Mian and Dietz call plumbing poverty. And again, there are high concentrations uh, of plumbing poverty in the black and minority ethnic population in the US. Next slide, please. And as I've already noted, indigenous populations in North America seem to suffer particularly, uh, com even compared with the broader uh, BAME community. In Canada, First Nations homes are 90 times more likely to be without running water compared with the Canadian average. Uh, and you see the, the comment above about uh, Native American, Black and Hispanic households in the United States. Next slide, please. So from a global perspective, we know, as, as several people said yesterday, including myself, the nexus between water and COVID-19 is a very important one, a very powerful one. We know that it has a global resonance. And I can report to you that Water and Sanitation Alliance UNESCO, World Health Organization uh, are all revitalized like, and spurred on by the global COVID-19 uh, e epidemic towards achieving um, SDG Sustainable Development Goal 6, and in particular 6.1, universal access to safe and reliable water supplies as key, not just to develop in, development in general, but to addressing the COVID-19 crisis. And as I said in the latter part of my opening comments, we know that this is also a North American, European uh, problem. It's a problem that also affects more developed economies. It is not possible for us to see this as purely a problem in the Global South. It is also a problem here at home in England. Jess Cook uh, gave us some statistics and information about that yesterday. I've added a little bit more talking about uh, plumbing poverty and the uh, tendency for black and minority ethnic communities in Europe, Europe and uh, England to uh, have a higher likelihood of experiencing lack of, of safe and secure water. So we know we have a problem at home too. and at this stage I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Patrick who'll tell us a little bit about what's going on more locally. Patrick. Okay. Right, thank you very much Chad. Now, Obviously, this is something that has had a great deal of attention from as, as a local water supply, and you've been speaking clearly about the global context on this. Um, but I think it's also interesting to look at the local context because we can actually map ourselves to that. Um, 
when we look at global changes and a global event, it's quite often easy to think of it as being something that is applied to other people. And one of the things about a global pandemic is that although we're all in different boats, we are all in the same storm. And so it it is affecting us. It is something that suddenly we all have in common. And so we can actually see the way that our own behaviours have changed. Now, obviously, one of the primary ones of those is that most of us are not going into our place of work anymore. Uh, most of us, and that's a change that probably was going to happen over time. It's just that rather startlingly, it happened on one day in March, uh, when rather than perhaps over a period of maybe five or 10 years, which would have been a gradual drift. But it means that there are probably slightly new baselines about what we expect to see in terms of water demand. Now, I'm just going to share my screen and show. So one of the advantages, I think, of a, a local water company like Bristol Water, which supplies an area of about a thousand square miles, is that we've got a lot of form in terms of looking back at quite consistent data sets over a long period. So if I show you. Hopefully you're able to see this graph. It, it's always a bit of a mystery, mystery to me on, on Teams, whether or not I am actually successfully showing things because it doesn't show up. But this, in fact, I'll go back one to the oldest stuff. So many people in this audience, this is rather, it's always a rather strange experience for me now because when I talk about the drought of 1975-76, it increasingly I'm speaking to people who look rather as though I'm talking about something that happened around the time of the Great Fire of London, but it was something that I lived through uh, as a kid in the UK, and it was something that did have quite a severe impact on the southwest in particular. Now, you can see this is uh, the red line is a 50 day moving average, but you can see the way that effectively demand was very heavily suppressed due to customer behaviour and due to the implementation of quite severe restrictions on what could be used, and then it bounced back. So you can see that there is there is a lower limit to which water supply can be taken. And this was around about 220 million litres per day for a population at the time that would have been just under a million people. But then you can see it's bounced back up in the 1990s. There was quite a lot of heavy industrial use going on in the 1990s. But perhaps what's slightly more important to note is that that's when it was at its highest. And so when we talk about the impact of COVID-19 and the effect that that has had on overall demand for water, what we've seen in this area, and I'll come on to another area of the southwest in a moment, but what we've seen in this area is that it hasn't actually led to a demand for more water. What it's doing is it's leading to a change in the way that people are using water. And that then leads to some quite important conclusions on water efficiency. So there's a since 1975, we can look in slightly more detail. And you can now see the line is lower. It's also perhaps a little bit less volatile. The, the peaks are, are much lower. So since 2010, so the last 10 years, you can see it's relatively consistent, the amount of water that's being put into supply. But if we look at this red line here is what's happened this year. So we, we divvy things up into hydrological years of April to April. So this is this happens effectively to overlay with what happened with lockdown. So the red line is what happened this year. Uh, the, the thicker black line that sort of tracks along at the bottom is effectively take that as an average and then another couple of lines are, are one other other years that we would be interested in for other reasons. What you can see with that red line is that it's become very volatile. And this is something that particularly happened around the May period. Very, very difficult to actually assign this to lockdown and to COVID-19, because also we had a really, really, uh, thinking back to May, everybody who was experiencing lockdown then was also experiencing a very warm, dry period. 
the point that I think is particularly interesting is the way that suddenly that demand drops off a cliff towards the end of May when we had some heavy rain. Now that indicates that this is water that people are sort of choosing to use. Now we've mentioned about hand washing. I don't think that hand washing has been the primary driver of this. I think that the primary driver of this has actually been garden use at this time because suddenly we had a nation of all of us thinking I've got nothing to do with my time really apart from perhaps spend some time in the garden and be able to uh, do that and it's all dry so I am going to water things but also it was warm and dry and so I, I've actually had my own little personal measure of how I thought demand was going to be which is to look out of my window from my home office and see how many sets of washing are drying on lines because that's also one of the things that we do when the weather is nice is we dry our washing outdoors it's a great drying day i'll put a load on and so we do get highly variable demand from that so this is garden watering this is water play and we see a lot of that and again i see a lot of that out through my back window i see kids running through sprinklers and playing with aqua slides and all of that suddenly drops off when it rains hard one day. So overall, demand itself has actually been pretty normal. The, to the total demand across the, the year as a whole has been average, but it's been a funny shape. Now that puts different stresses on the system, means we've had a larger number of burst water mains this year. But in terms of resource management, it doesn't create any particularly difficult to manage problems. So that's the context that we're working in. And I think perhaps rather than just me continuing to monologue, Chad, I'll just give another final one of what's happening elsewhere further southwest, because one of the things that we are all doing is we're being much more cautious about traveling further, further afield. And so people are staycationing. People are staying in the UK. And this means that Cornwall across the summer holiday has been full. I've had a couple of friends who wanted to go camping in Cornwall and they couldn't find a campsite which had any spaces at all across the whole of the summer holiday. One friend ended up actually having quite a nice holiday, but in Canterbury, which was not where he had been expecting to go at all. Now, this means that you've got systems which suddenly in other areas of the country are experiencing much higher levels of stress than they're ever, ever experienced before. So in the far southwest of the uk it's the highest demand that's ever been seen across the summer period heading direct into the bournemouth area another holiday area so these are sets of information produced from a, a colleague of mine in southwest water uh, sudden spike that they hadn't seen the like of it before but there were no tourists at the time in Bournemouth. It was the height of lockdown. So there's some funny stuff going on. I suspect there's going to be a lot of PhDs written about this in the, uh, in the coming century. <laughs> so I think I'll, I'll stop there in terms of monologuing and try to work out how to unshare my screen, which I always wonder about. Hopefully that's successfully unshared as well now. And so, Chad, let's chat about what's going on rather than me just continuing to <laughs> be on broadcast. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. I'm um, just flicking back to uh, through the comments box looking for questions. Um, the first uh, observation is a general one from Helena saying that uh, recognition of the water COVID-19 nexus is quite um, as an academic, I would definitely agree. Nexus is one of those words that uh, we didn't use really 10 years ago and is now commonly used to mean intersection. So the, the way in which water and COVID-19 uh, butt up against each other or interact uh, or uh, representation in Patrick's comments. He gave a very local uh, and very high resolution uh, interpretation, but we're both talking about the water. Um, and as I said yesterday, I think it means that as water professionals, we've never been more relevant in a way. Um, 
I think that's un probably under recognized in uh, the broader community. Patrick? Yes, it was it was one of the things that really struck me during the clap for carers event and with uh, a lot of talk about the importance of key workers. And I have colleagues who be out at three o'clock in the morning uh, up to their armpits in filthy water, sorting out burst water mains in order to ensure that there is a supply of water. I mean, Chad, you know the phrase I use. People think about water as much as they think about air. Not at all until you haven't got access. And at that point, it gets your undivided attention. And I, I think in the UK in particular, we run into this sort of paradoxical problem that what we do as a water industry is so important that it has to be done in a way that is utterly reliable. Once it becomes utterly reliable, then it becomes absolutely invisible. And so the very idea that there were tens of thousands of people across the UK continuously working across very difficult and very challenging circumstances throughout the whole lockdown period to make sure that everybody had the most reliable and absolutely safe drinking water supply and sewerage services never really came up on anybody's radar. So having your bins collected, people stood out and clapped for that. That's crucial. That's absolutely vital. Having NHS services managed properly and having those key, key workers who were at personal risk delivering those, absolutely crucial, absolutely vital. Having safe drinking water, absolutely crucial, absolutely vital, absolutely invisible. And so, yes, I didn't once hear somebody say, oh, great for all of those people working on that. And I think it's quite a strong reflection of of just how invisible that sector is. It's invisible precisely because it is so important, but it is something that uh, as, as a key worker uh, sort of organization, yes, I sort of see my colleagues and the, the lengths that they have had to go to, to make sure that everybody's water supply is safe. Uh, and I, I must admit, I felt a bit vexed on their behalf <laughs> when you're talking to people who've had a really tough time and nobody even noticed. Okay, uh, next comment I'm seeing in the chat box is about baselines and Sarah points out, and I think this references your, your early comment, Patrick, about 1976 as a, a reference point. So that's the definition of about for a generation of people. Yeah. But that generation is now perhaps a little more... <clears throat> <laughs> a little less young. <laughs> Um, so the baseline against which we measure consumption or against which we perceive change is quite important. Uh, I was intrigued by your comment that after 1976, we seem to have gone through a period through the 80s and 90s where baselines rose yes. before now perhaps coming down again, because, of course, we've all become environmentalists. We've all become conservationists now. And I wonder what that will mean for the next generation. I, I am not well suited to answer that question. Uh, I think this is an interesting one. I think there's a, it, as is always the case with uh, a sort of large, slow moving change, there's, there's quite a lot of reasons behind that change. Uh, one of them would be that leakage rates now are very, very much less than they were back in the 90s and certainly very much less than they were in the 1970s. It's actually quite difficult to know what leakage rates were back historically. I mean, our best estimates is that they were probably twice what they are now. But we don't know because we didn't really have the, the technology or the methodologies to find out what they were. So that's one thing that will have gradually driven a baseline down. Another one is the change in the nature of industry in this area. So, for instance, in the Avonmouth area, we previously had some very large, heavy users of water, which are just simply gone. Those industries have either changed the nature of what they do so that they no longer use water in the same way, or they've closed down entirely, or they've bugged out to another place, uh, another another part of the world, because there'll be different drivers for, for those large industries. And then, of course, we are all now in environmentalists. 
that we are we are interested. In. But I think there is there is an interesting point here that our baseline <clears throat> in terms of per capita consumption. I mentioned about how the amount of water being put into supply is relatively normal for this time of year. But one of the things that we measure as the UK water industry is this slightly odd measure that we refer to as per capita consumption, which is consumption of water in the home. And so our targets are based around, from a regulatory perspective, the water that we all use in our homes. It's a slightly odd one because it means that if I work in an office and I shower in the office and I'm using all the water facilities there all the time, that's not my water use from a regulatory perspective. That is that company's water use. Mm -hmm. If I come back and do exactly the same things and use precisely the same water back in my house, that's my per capita consumption. This is a thing that companies are incentivized on and have targets on. And so suddenly I think our per capita consumption, because everybody's at home, is going to be at a higher baseline. But I think there's a real chance that it may just drift up anyway. The UK as a whole has sort of globally relatively low per capita consumption if you compare us with many, many other countries. Um, the moment that I speak with people from a regulatory perspective about per capita consumption, I'm just on a countdown to the point that they say Germany. Because in Germany, there is a lower per capita consumption than in the UK. And you say, yes, that's true. That, that is true. However, if you want to compare us with Saudi Arabia or Australia or Las Vegas, then it would be quite quite a different story. It's uh, there's a big assumption that PCC that our water use will just go down. I think as a society, there's an equally large risk that it may go up. I want to pick up on that point about PCC um, because, I, it, as you know, it's it's a it's a measure that's always intrigued me, uh, not least because in our long running study of student residential water consumption at the University of the West of England, we have regularly posted PCCs in excess of 150, 160, 170 litres per person per day. And the question was, well, how could that be since these people don't have outdoor uses? Um, and we know that outdoor uses are for the general population quite important. And it took us a while to realize that one of the things that was going on is that in our study, we were actually capturing a much higher proportion of personal water use because the nature of the accommodation and the relationship between the accommodation and what the student residents were doing during the day, going to classes, all that kind of stuff coming back, meant that we were capturing the vast majority of their water use. In other words, our measure was much more accurate if by per capita consumption you mean exactly how much yes. water is consumed per capita, per individual. That has the implication that the standard industry rule of thumb of 140, 150 litres per person per day is way off. Yes, and I think that's absolutely correct. Message that's quite difficult for us to... Um, because because it's quite directly opposed to the direction that the industry is effectively instructed that it must move in, that we must move towards greater efficiency, obviously lower leakage, reduction of water abstracted from the environment. It's much more straightforward when working with regulators to say, yes, we'll work to deliver this, than to point out some of the basic issues that actually arise with the way that those measures are done and also the possible risk that they may change if showering behavior and as we as we know from the the ue student study showering seems to be one of the primary consumers of water if that becomes a social norm through people's lives and in fact if water only costs two or three pounds a ton then if it's a really lovely thing that you thoroughly enjoy doing and it's it's your luxurious activity, it may well carry through your whole life. So that's it, that could be a baseline that goes upwards fairly steeply. I'd, I'd like to uh, go back to the chat box and, and pick up a number of questions that are actually effectively asking us to think at even higher resolution. 
they're asking us to think a little bit about distinctions between um, residential and non-residential, which we've talked about a little, um, about indoor versus outdoor water uses, and also about water use across the arc of the day. So all of those questions are actually probing what do we know perhaps, uh, what data do we already have in hand that helps us think at those resolutions? Some of the stuff, uh, there's, a, there's sort of two separate questions here actually, I think. One is amounts and volumes, and these are comparatively straightforward to measure because you can put a water meter on and do ultra high granularity measurements, whether this is across a large area or down to a single water fitting. And so it's possible to obtain numeric information. What I think is actually much more difficult to understand is certain sectors of water behaviours. And it was something that struck me when talking with a, a colleague from Wessex Water, in fact, about water efficiency and about personal behaviours, is there are, there are certain behaviours that we have which are public, so that could be garden watering use, and then there are certain aspects of our lives, you know, the food we eat, we do in public, we do in front of other people, and we understand what everybody else does with that. The exercise we take, we do that together, we see and we understand. But there are other private water behaviours which are innately private and are much more difficult to investigate. And this is things like, for instance, how long somebody spends in the shower, because there's a there's an implication there of, sort of well, what on earth are you doing if you're spending that long in the shower? And there's also even down to things like how often do you use the lavatory? It's a very personal question to ask somebody. Most people will grossly underestimate what's going on. And even down to things like, well, how often do you press the one, the small button flush or the large button flush? You're actually asking somebody how often do they do a poo? And it's a really personal question to ask. And so we don't tend to get that kind of information coming back in quite the same way. And I think that is where working with sort of as an industry, we're very good at picking up granular flow data and understanding those. What we're much less good at is understanding personal behaviours that people don't really want to talk about with us because they see it as quite understandably really none of our business. And I think working on that is going to be very productive. Um, I just add to that that one of the advantages of developing the university based student accommodation based uh, survey of water use over many years um, is that we, we have an opportunity to engage that direct relationship with our consumers in this case. And we've been able to act, probe those questions. We've been able to test uh, some of those ideas. Uh, we've got I've got a PhD student right now, Karen Simpson, who's completing a PhD, actually looking at another fraction of water use that's fairly personal but fairly important, and that's showering. I see a number of comments about showering in the chat boxes. People are wondering or speculating that perhaps more home working, um, and maybe when we return to whatever the new normal is, more bicycling. That's what our prime minister would like us to do. Will that mean more showering? So. A lot of water use tracks back to personal hygiene and showering. And so what Karen has been doing in her study is looking at the practices of showering and the ways in which uh, cultural expectations, fixtures and fittings, and the kinds of, of soap products and shampoo products that we use actually have water debits independent of our own motivations or behaviors or beliefs. In other words, the fixtures and fittings uh, mean that we will use a certain amount of water however we feel about it uh, because that's just what they do. Um, so in that study we, we are able to ask these slightly more personal questions 
uh, of folks, but I appreciate it's pretty difficult for Bristol Water to go uh, and knock on someone's door and say, uh, excuse me, Mr. Stadden, can you tell me how many number poos, uh, number twos <laughs> you, <laughs> you, uh, uh, you've disposed of today? Exactly. You, yeah, it's it is tricky. And and I think the the facts, yes, working with working with students, I think is it's one really, really important sector to look at because you're specifically looking at future water users. Um, and the thing is also they're perhaps a slightly more open audience to this kind of interaction, whereas there will be other demographics which are genuinely hard to reach. I mean, I know we, we refer to these as hard to reach sectors, uh, but once you try, you realise they're called hard to reach because they're really, really hard to reach and because you're talking to people who who genuinely don't want to have anything to do with you. Um, and so, yes, if you if you're attempting to interact with people who are street homeless, you know, they'll be furious <laughs> that you've because they've got an awful lot more going on in their lives than the nonsense that you're now talking to them. OK, I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat box, pick up on any final questions before closing uh, this session, since I'm mindful of time. Uh, Sarah Bunny observes that there's a generational um, aspect to this. Her grandfather didn't waste a drop. He recycled the bath water for the toilet, uh, used dishwater uh, in the garden, um, etc. My own grandmother used to use the same soap for pretty much anything. She had a big bar of what we called lye soap. Uh, which she would mm -hmm. cut off chunks for the washing machine. Uh, the same soap was used basically to scrub the grandkids. Um, and I'm still here, so you know, it's obviously not uh, too terrible a strategy. Although my memory is that that soap was really quite um, quite powerful Risk. stuff. You didn't want to get it in your eyes, <laughs> definitely. Um, uh, in a, on a different track, there's a comment here about water for homelessness is a very important issue, particularly as we're thinking not just uh, generally about the homeless population and their water needs, but COVID-19. And once again, here's a population that uh, does not have safe and reliable uh, access to, to clean water supplies for personal hygiene. I would just point out uh, for colleagues' interest, you could look at my hometown, the city of Vancouver, which has a fleet of, last time I looked, something like 200 water fountains and water dispensers, some of which are fixed, some of which are mobile, and the city of Vancouver actually moves them around to accommodate, among other, other users, the homeless population in the city. Uh, I have not been back to Vancouver um, to check to see how they've been manipulating them or, or managing that fleet in the context of COVID, but it would be quite an interesting uh, question to follow up. If anyone's interested, let me know. I can give you contacts at the City of Vancouver Engineering Department. Um, a few comments uh, in the chat boxes saying that we've got a couple of other papers coming up that will begin to help us unpack some of these this data about per capita consumption, about different fractions of use. So that those are trailers uh, for uh, papers coming up in the next se session. I should probably um, bring this session to a close since we're now one minute uh, over and one minute into the next session. So uh, we could we could talk for hours and hours and hours. I know Patrick and, and myself uh, are, are united in in hoping that colleagues get in touch independently uh, with for for further discussion, further interest. We're fairly easy to find the World Wide Web, um, and we're here uh, today. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your comments. Thank you very much, uh, participants, for your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to quite all of them, but it looks like we'll have another chance to uh, discuss some of these issues in the next section. Thank you, everyone. The task now is to go back to the program and follow the link to one of the two parallel sessions, whichever one you wish uh, to attend. Uh, session one, knowledges, uh, engagement and participation for social change, which will be chaired by my colleague Stroma Cole. And session two, resilience, policy and governance for urban and built environments, which will be chaired by my colleague Tanti Octavianti. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you in the parallel sessions starting as quickly as we can. Thank you.
And just in addition there, if we go straight from the parallel sessions into the break, hopefully the break will absorb any overspill from the parallel sessions and then we'll reconvene around 11 o'clock. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for that, Sarah. So welcome back, everybody. Um, hope everybody made it back from the parallel sessions and there's nobody sort of lurking about in one of the other rooms waiting for something to happen. <laughs> we will check to make sure that any last people have come across from the rooms. Um, so welcome back to the main room. Um, really, really excellent parallel session um, in the room that I was in. We talked a lot of about a lot of things, um, some really good presentations, a lot um, of detail about the kind of things that people have done in various projects um, and explored a lot of different things um, and a lot of different topics, which we'll summarise uh, in a bit more detail a bit later. Um, also, interestingly, I wondered during the break um, if we were in a physical space um, for the conference, we would have seen a peak in water use as everybody rushed to the toilet or rushed to get a coffee. And it's nice to think that we've actually distributed that water use across lots of dis different water service provider areas. So we are doing our bit. Um, and on that note, I'd like to hand over to Lutz, who's hopefully in the room. I think I can see him there um, for the start of the special session two on resilience and integrated water management call to action. And this is actually um, the Water Reuse Technical Committee um, of the Water Efficiency Network that's coordinated this session for us. So over to Lutz, if you could turn your camera and your mic on, please. Hello, everyone. Hope everybody can see me. Hello. Just checking if you can hear me. Let me just. Um, Hi, Lutz, we can hear you. Yeah, all good, all good, all right. <laughs> Oh, right, let me let me just uh, then uh, put my presentation up. Hear anybody. Uh, can anybody hear me? So here, uh, I'm like, uh, yeah, I'll not. Mike, I'll I'll start. Yeah. Can I start? I got it's kind of a. Does everybody see my presentation? Yeah, we can see it. OK, well, let me start here. Good. Well, first of all, thank you very much for joining the session here from the technical committee. Our subject was resilience and integrated water management in this conference. And of course, if we we're looking into the world, you know, with all the droughts happening and of course, you're well aware of the Day zero at Cape Town that was just dodged the bullet, I think, um, but they're probably not out of the woodwork yet. And we're having seen more and more happening in the world and uh, not only water, uh, water problems, but also flooding comes into the play, especially here in the UK. So I want to just touch on really quickly yeah, because I'm pretty sure that most of the audience are aware of the the issues that have been raised, especially by the uh, um, chairman of the Environment Agency last year talking about the jaws of death um, in terms of that we are running out of water in the, by 2050. As far as I understand, the, most water companies had ended in, in their plans that they they see an, an increase of demand, but uh, reduced supply um, there for the jaws of death. And I'm just wondering if we sleep walking into this because uh, I remember having presentations like this in 2013 from the environmental agency kind of literally saying the same thing. So unfortunately, until now, not much has happened in terms of uh, uh, flood management, if I talk about suds, um, and of course, onto the water reuse side. So our subject today is a little bit talking about the opportunity in integrated water management. Um, you know, here's the quick definition of Syria, uh, collaborative approach to management of land and water that delivers coordinated management of water shortage, supply, demand, wastewater, flood risk, quality of water and the wider environment. 
So now we're looking, of course, not into the portable water side of things. We're looking into the scale of how can we use um, sources that we haven't been considering in the past and uh, using it at the same time, combining it with the, the flood management element of it. And I'm just putting a couple of you know words into there. Rain gardens, green walls, rainwater, stormwater harvesting. These are all elements that we're talking about. And often these are talked about in separate elements. You know, I've come across a lot of systems where people talk about rainwater harvesting, but not even considering it to integrate it into the attenuation element of this. Um, so that's kind of sad. And I just want to make a case. Um, in fact, you will see later on, we have a couple of more presenters, as you know, that will go into more details of things. But I wanted to kind of touch on, of course, what the, the opportunity of water reuse really is. Because conventionally, everybody talks about three let's say water systems, if I might say, um, drinking water supply, then of course that water goes into some wastewater elements and of course drainage of the rainwater when it rains needs to be happening as well. Now that's what the conventional way is, but in fact, there's a lot of alternative water sources in a building if we keep digging a little bit more closely. Um, we could discuss or really probably identify different sources um, like condensate. I mean, from you know, air conditioning systems and, and elements or, or um, cooling towers, bleed off water that's been discharged into the sewer. Of course, sewage from toilets, as we, we call it, black water in this instance. Gray water recycling, this is a big element of, of using shower and hand wash basin water. Uh, and then we have, of course, rainwater that drops on the roof or maybe even stormwater that runs off hard standing areas. So these are all, you know, kind of sources. And it's all about kind of looking into the, the you know, literally what kind of water quality do I get? And do I have reuse elements in the building or, you know, surrounding the building where that water quality would be sufficient to use? So I don't have to go through all the way to treating it to portable standards and then reusing it as long as I have a use for, for lesser quality, just like the toilet. Yeah, and this, I think it's already accepted that uh, toilet flushing, irrigation and washing machines, for example, surely don't need any any high level portable water. Um, you know, in, in uh, you know, just to to, um, to use them, and at the same time, what a lot of people forget: if you do recycle that water, you're reducing the outflow from the building. So there's a, a big impact on flow of uh, sewer flow reductions, especially on the rainwater harvesting or the rainwater side, combination with attenuation, and things like that. So this is where where it's going kind of very interesting, and we want to kind of address a couple of questions here. And um, the following speakers, uh, Lydia, is going to look into the public perception and if there's a, is there's a, is there's a barrier. Uh, Peter Henley from WSCU will be looking to standards and regulations, especially in the SUTS, uh, in, in, the, in the water flooding element of it. And then we have Mike Farnsworth from Stormsaver looking into energy demand if, of these systems. Is that counterproductive or uh, maybe not? And I want to just touch on really quickly on policies and finances uh, because are they needed and, and where would money come from to do this? And unfortunately, as you all know, there are no policies in place in, in the UK at present for any of the water reuse, nor the SUTS element. Um, maybe Wales could be a, an exception there. Um, but finances, there's surely no support for this at present. And therefore, I wanted to touch on one, one of the slides uh, before I hand over to my um, you know, co-speakers there. Uh, talk about some international uh, experiences or literally share with you what's happening around the world. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm German um, and I've been well, living here now for 16 years. But in Germany, where rainwater harvesting and grey water cycling is a little bit more common than it is here in the, in the UK. Um, they just, uh, the state of Hessen just decided to literally look into dual pipe work across the state um, as being a part of a, a policy, literally a, a, um, a party coalition document, uh, which we're looking forward to how they're going to implement this. Um, as you may be aware of uh, London, it's mandatory to put a rainwater harvesting systems into every new build or major refurbishment, and that's already going on since 2007. Uh, US been uh, catching up pretty much New York and San Francisco. Very interesting. I had a couple of chats with these guys um, in the city of New York and San Francisco, why they're having these schemes in place. So they literally put in financial schemes for larger uh, water reuse systems. And New York is not doing it because they have a problem with water supply. It's all about sewer capacity issues. So New York is supporting the idea of having water recycled in buildings in order to reduce the impact on the sewer system. 
Um, one point to mention is that they, with the financial support they, that they give, which is quite considerable, I'm, I'm happy to share some more information on this, um, that they um, have a condition of that the system has to show a performance over 10 years. So the the, the, the owner or um, um, operator has to literally hand in a yearly um, report on the system's performance. And the same in San Francisco, where, of course, they have a massive drought issue. So um, uh, San Francisco is pushing for water reuse because of the water supply uh, problems they're having. They they already been uh, uh, have a mandatory dual pipe work, um, purple pipe work in, in certain areas of San Francisco in order to allow later on using, you know, non-portable water to supply in whole districts. So literally every building that goes up in that kind of district has to have a dual supply. If they're not already putting a system in, they do have that and be able to retrofit something in the future. Um, and they did in, introduce a mandatory scheme for, for large scale buildings. Again, the minute you have financial support in place, they require a 10 year performance guarantee. Um, I talked to Sydney uh, City and this was also interesting. Uh, they were talking about the um, low high density uh, downtown issues with uh, skyscrapers. And I think we're running into the same problem in, in, in London where you were putting more and more high rise buildings up where before there was maybe a 10 story building when we're now putting 40 story buildings. Unfortunately, the pipe work in the, in the road doesn't increase just because we're putting a bigger building up. So what in Sydney they did is that they literally um, um, the, the obligation is if you want to build a bigger 40 story building in that place that the water footprint of that building would not exceed the one that was standing there before. So literally that, of course, makes it uh, well, well, almost impossible to do if you're not using a uh, water recycling system or very low flow uh, devices. And we just had a presentation from Peter on, on the uh, proper layer uh, toilets, for example, that will make the, you know, these things possible. So you will see there is policy out there. There's financial support out in the, in the world, unfortunately not uh, in the UK. So really, uh, this is something that we probably want to discuss later on. Uh, and I hope we'll have a, uh, have a good discussion. But at this point, I want to literally hand over to uh, Lindy, Lydia at this point. And I probably we're going to move through the, the uh, presentations from one to the other in order to not waste any time. Lydia, I'll hand over to you. I'll, I'll just. Yeah, yeah. Can you I'll drop. Yeah, yeah, I'll drop. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to sort of put my camera on and say hello to everyone. Um, in order to make sure I kept my time, I pre-recorded the um, presentation. So um, hopefully Eleanor can get set that up for me now. Hello, my name is Lydia Makin and I'm the Policy and Projects Manager at Fortwise. Thanks very much for having me speak. So I've got three bits of research to bring to your attention today, um, all around water reuse and water efficiency. So the first one um, is a public perceptions of water reuse piece that we did um, internally at Waterwise and published in September 2019. We did this work in collaboration with the GLA. Uh, we used a micro survey approach where we surveyed 200 respondents for two separate surveys, each with just three questions each. Um, we used an app called One Pulse where the questions literally get pulsed to people's phones and if they've got the app downloaded it just pops up and they have to answer the question um, which means that we can get responses within about 10 minutes. We also did 10 in-depth interviews um, with non-water industry people from the general public um, just to get a more in-depth view um, of the public perceptions of rainwater harvesting and grey water recycling. The aim of this study was to discover whether people were familiar with the concept of grey water recycling and rainwater harvesting, how people feel about the idea of having one of the systems in their home, um, and also what potential barriers there were to installing these systems. We were referring to these systems as specifically for toilet flushing, um, as we thought that the take up and the kind of acceptability levels would be higher if we defined exactly what we'd be, we would be using the water for. So some of the key findings, so three quarters of the participants claimed to be familiar with these systems, they knew what they were. And a half, half, of, the, half of people had heard of systems, um, of grey water recycling systems being used uh, to flush toilets, so that's using shower water to flush toilets. Um, most people felt very positive about the idea of having rainwater harvesting systems um, and also grey water slightly more for 
the rainwater with 87% um, over 86%. We found people generally preferred rainwater harvesting, probably due to the perception that it's cleaner than grey water. Um, although we were careful not to use the term grey water, we referred to it um, more in, in lines of saying recycled water or reusing water, as we felt that grey water would have some negative connotations. But the overriding feeling was that people were accepting of both, um, especially referencing the fact that it's only going down the toilet. So by far the biggest barrier to having one of these systems um, was cost and people are assuming it would be expensive, although a couple of people also mentioned that they would um, sort of assume that they would come with a government subsidy or a grant. I think maybe mirroring the kind of solar grants, the solar um, subsidies that we are familiar with. People mentioning um, upheaval of insulation as well as also being a barrier. Um, but we found, especially in the in-depth interviews, that the more knowledge and understanding people had about these systems, the more accepting they were likely to be. Some comments that came out around rainwater harvesting, uh, a couple there around cost, um, saying, but also some positive things, saying they would be very excited to have one at home um, and that nothing would stop me from wanting this. So, um, yeah, overwhelmingly positive, um, but worried about cost. Similar picture with grey water recycling. Um, but a couple more mentions of hygiene, um, people talking about dirty water and it being stagnated um, in the systems. Um, somebody even saying that they think it might devalue their house. Um, so a bit more, a bit more sort of mixed in terms of grey water recycling. So there's loads more um, information in that report that I won't go into now, but you can find the full report on the Water Wise database, um, which is free to access through our website and has lots of interesting reports um, and studies not just done by us but done by others as well. So the, the within that report there's also a great lit review um, looking at public perceptions that my colleague Kate did so do go and have a read of that. Okay so the next um, bit of research that I'd like to bring to your attention was one that the Welsh Government did. Um, 1,000 people were surveyed in Wales to look at public attitudes towards water efficiency um, and this was less around water reuse, but still really relevant for anyone working in the sector. So um, they were looking at environmental attitudes and comparing um, being water efficient with uh, recycling and with eating less meat. So um, more people are looking to save water than they are to eat less meat, but nowhere near as many as um, recycling with 91% there. But the good news, 85% um, of respondents agreed that everyone needs to save water and even better, 55% agreed that they would save water even if it required additional effort. Um, yeah, lots of interesting stats and facts in there um, and I would encourage you to go and have a read of that. It's also on our WorldWise database. Okay, finally, um, this project here is something I've been working on over the last year um, with Ricardo, the consultant, the Environment Agency, and lots of other um, water companies on our project steering group, including Term 7 Trent Anglian, NRW and Welsh Water. So this research was to look at the costs and benefits of rainwater harvesting and grey water recycling and to update those reports from the Environment Agency published around 2010. Um, obviously, we've got much better technology now and better understanding of um, embedded carbon and carbon emissions. So there's some really positive uh, results coming out of that research. So Ricardo used 125 systems from three different suppliers to um, design their model. Um, thank you if any of those suppliers are on the call or anyone that supplied information to Ricardo for this work, we really appreciated it. Um, so just to summarise it, we looked at direct benefits to um, the installer and also indirect benefits to kind of wider society um, and the environment talking about flood damage, CO2 reduction from mains water and reducing the need for new infrastructure. Um, and these benefits and costs were either felt privately by the individual or by society and I quite like the fact that um, both of those areas were explored and kind of separated out in this report. So rainwater harvestings show a total net benefit across all collection surface areas um, and demand requirements. So that's when you look at social, those wider social factors are included. Um, those larger systems present a really attractive opportunity and the CBA really shows that. Um, and that opportunity is net benefits both privately and socially, um, obviously for those larger installations. 
Um, a slightly different picture is grey water recycling. So we um, were only able to model using 22 um, case studies on grey water systems, and this is all for um, insulation on a new build, so not a retrofit. Um, so capex and opex costs were included, the carbon costs um, embedded in the tank and the system, and we looked at direct benefits, again, um, reduction in mains water use and therefore cost, reduction in the amount of water discharge to sewer, and we looked at those indirect societal benefits in terms of reduction of CO2 and reduction of the need for new infrastructure. Um, results showed that for the smallest systems, um, like one, one house sort of in size, that there wasn't a net private um, benefit, so there is a private cost to the individual. Um, but the larger the systems, obviously the bigger the benefits um, to the individual um, installer and to society. So there was also a second report produced the Environment Agency on policy options and incentives to encourage the, um, the development and installation of these systems. Um, so that has gone directly to the Environment Agency and um, it remains to be seen whether that's going to be made public at this point. Um, but keep a lookout for that as well. So um, WaterWise will look to disseminate the results of these um, reports um, in our various networks and um, I'll be feeding back to the GLA as well about these. So yeah, have a look on our database and um, I think that it's a much, they paint a much more positive picture than um, the reports did 10 years ago. Okay, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, and I'll welcome any questions at the end. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I think uh, it's my turn now, um, so I'll just... Can everybody see that? Hopefully. Hi, right, so um, I am uh, covering um, sort of the areas of round legislation and uh, standards within uh, integrated water management. Um, my name's Peter Henley. I work for the WRC. I'm the Pollution and Flooding Reduction Lead. Um, so I'm approaching it from more the uh, how do we deal with wastewater um, and how can we minimise some of the impacts uh, to the environment um, from when it escapes out of the pipe. Um, so that's the areas I'm going to try and look at today. So um, why is uh, integrated water management needed? Well, I think uh, the pit review really brought into focus uh, the need for uh, surface water management. Um, and the uh, I think there was a mention of 1975 and 1976 drought. Well, I remember those, but uh, I can certainly remember the uh, the impact of the flooding in, in 2007 and uh, how that had an impact. So this is where the government really started to look at how do we manage that? And it saw the introduction of the Flood and Water Management Act in uh, 2010, um, which addressed or assessed how do we manage our, our surface water and our, our wastewater discharges. But we've still got a problem. Um, in uh, the EA have released data um, that um, revealed that there was 200,000 spills from uh, combined so sewer overflows in 2019. So looking forward, you know, is that a situation where we'd really like to be in? Um, we're left with a legacy issue with our combined sewer network and the CSOs provide a, a relief or a, a pressure relief when during high storm periods. Um, but is it really acceptable moving into the sort of 21st century that we're still discharging, although dilute uh, sewage, um, but into our, our wastewater, into our water courses. So it's an area that we really need to try to address. And going forward, there'd be a greater challenge to that. And there's legis private members legislation uh, or a bill being brought forward this autumn to try and tackle um, this issue um, and making the water companies as the polluters um, 
be, be responsible for that pollution. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops because it's not always uh, the water company's fault that these uh, incidents occur. And we've still got surface water flooding. Um, we've only had to see casting back through uh, the last uh, prior to sort of COVID. We had the floods of January and uh, you know the, that impact. Um, so we still need to manage our surface water in a far better way to prevent flooding uh, of properties. And uh, so how is that done? And how can we improve, improve capacity in the network? And then we've got the, the impact of diffuse pollution. So pollution that's washed off our roads, our hard surfaces from the land um, and how it, how it finds its way into the water, uh, the water system. You know, there's a lot of plastic, uh, microplastics, um, other pollutants, hydrocarbons. Um, and there was a study shown um, there that uh, road runoff really damages the roads, um, the, the water courses. So uh, rubber from tires, uh, paint on the roads, all destroyed, moved, washed away into our water courses. Uh, so is there a better need for uh, more water quality management uh, to make sure that any runoff from our hard uh, areas is uh, managed and cleansed before it goes into the uh, into the water course. So how can we in improve those situations? And as Lutz mentioned, you know, the jaws of death talk, um, we're approaching a situation where water will run out. So we need to make use of this valuable resource and how can we best use that in the most effective manner? Uh, so there's a policy confusion in the UK at the moment. Um, the, there is no uniform approach. Uh, Scotland has led the way uh, for some time now, as with most cases with legal uh, approaches, uh, Scotland has had SUDS as a general requirement for some time. Um, Wales have stopped, stepped up to the plate and um, have adopted a mandatory adoption approach with water reuse as the, the first step in its surface water hierarchy. So they recognise that uh, surface water management is not only about uh, flood risk, it's also about improving water quality. Um, in England, we've uh, sort of uh, adopted a more non-mandatory adoption route uh, focused uh, on the uh, planning system. Um, but a lot of the guidance, the documentation is really focused around flood risk and reducing that rather than improving water quality. Um, so there's a there's a, a gap there in, in that particular area. And Northern Ireland, um, they've adopted a, a, non, a no automatic right of connection for new development. So it's almost forcing uh, developers there in Northern Ireland to assess the use of SUDS first um, and to justify that connection to the surface water management system as and when that occurs. So in England, um, the policy approach, well, the national planning policy framework sets out the planning procedures, uh, policies for the UK and how these should be applied. And it sees that major developments should incorporate sustainable drainage systems, unless is there is clear evidence uh, that it would not be appropriate. So there's, a, there's a, an incentive to do that, um, but how is that enforced? How is that made? Uh, imposed upon the uh, developer. Well, that's really that discussion between uh, the various stakeholders. And one of the key factors around that adoption um, is the, the ongoing maintenance of any installed devices. Um, so that needs to be explained and developed with uh, leading flood part, the leading the lead local flood authority and the local planning agency. Uh, so how do you explore those uh, mechanisms for adoption. So increasingly we see the adopting authorities are the uh, are the lead local flood authorities, the highways authorities that are increasingly using as, as SUDs and increasingly, and I'll, I'll go on to this in a little bit more detail, the water and sewerage companies um, and also the private companies as well. So they could be adopted at, but all need to understand the, the role of maintenance and ongoing um, uh, upkeep of those features. 
So within water company adoption, um, suds adoption is not uniform across the across England, and neither are suds components or design requirements that are used. So, um, off what addressed this issue by uh, bringing out uh, the sewerage sector guidance documentation in 20 April 2020. Uh, and this looked and addressed uh, the need for surface water adoption for all water companies and it increased the uh, scope of assets that could be adopted by the water companies. And the adoption guidance is found in the design and construction guidance document. Uh, and this replaces the uh, WRC publication sewers for adoption, which is has been well used over the over several decades now. Um, but this really brought around the uh, Water UK guidance that includes adoptable features which are new to the water companies around detention basins, swales, rills, uh, underdrain swells, swales, sorry, uh, ponds and wetlands, and also infiltrations and soakaways. So moving away from the traditional piped uh, asset uh, to much more open uh, uh, features uh, that absorb the surface water in and act in some ways to uh, improve water quality and also but their primary focus is really around flood risk prevention. Um, in Wales, as I say, they've, they've almost stepped up to the plate and they've introduced uh, Schedule 3 of the Water Flood and Water Management Act in, uh, from 2010 and that came into effect. So this effectively made it mandatory that new developments shall comply with the Welsh uh, government standards. Um, and this um, ensured that new uh, developers uh, would have to address the issue around sustainable drainage. And as I've mentioned, uh, there's a key focus there on able to uh, look at water quality as a key feature. And so there's uh, various guidance, but um, the there is mechanisms within that structure uh, to enable uh, developers to assess and understand what they need to do in terms of uh, surface water management and how that can be applied across their development. And there are even access uh, permissions and accessible, accessible uh, data sources for the, the, water, the, the developers to use. Uh, so Wales are, are moving forward in this area and it'll be interesting to see how they uh, take that forward etc. So in terms of touching on standards and they're pretty well known, uh, obviously the Syria manual as I think it's been mentioned already um, and there are non-statutory guidance in, the, in England um, and obviously as I've mentioned uh, statutory guidance for the Welsh from the Welsh Government um, and they also the local authorities in England and Wales have introduced their own policy guidance uh, which can be followed and touching on the other areas around grey water, there are obviously standards, British standards, European standards that address some of those needs. So there's a, a raft of information, uh, but I think what it probably does lack is a, a little bit of consistency across the piece. Uh, so that what that is an area that needs to be addressed. So I think I'm rapidly moving out of time. Um, so just as an up, uh, sort of a finishing point, um, what are the enablers? Well. There are good standards out there. Um, the water quality improvements are proven. Um, so this should um, motivate government and uh, um, uh, our local authorities to adopt. The flood risk reduction potential is being shown and uh, things like the Welsh, uh, Welsh waters, uh, cityscape, uh, rainscape, sorry, programs have demonstrated that you can reduce the impact on uh, sewer flooding and uh, pollution incidents by in, in removing surface water from our networks. And there are improved societal benefits. So more rather than piped and storage facilities underground, if we've got more accessible water features, it's a, there's a benefit to society, society in that. So there are enablers, but there are also barriers, particularly there's lack of legislation in England. There seems to be a uh, a lack of appetite to imp impose mandatory standards on developers. Uh, so that's restricting the, the move towards uptake. And it needs changes to planning guidance as well to make it uh, much more um, consistent and uh, uh, centralised in approach. And 
as with coming out of COVID and economic regeneration, this may stifle uptake as there's a, a, a need to build, 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 rather than build with a sensible up, uh, maintenance of view of how to improve the, the, uh, the environment as we progress in, in development. Um, so there's that aspect to it. And then the age old question, what's going to happen after Brexit? Where are standards going to sit? Um, that's a big open question. I'm certainly not going to try and touch on that today. So a quick whistle stop through standards and uh, uh, legislation. Thank you for listening. Uh, these are my details if you need to contact me. you back. Over to you, Mike, I think. OK, uh, so I hope everybody can hear me then. Uh, just uh, bring up my presentation. So, OK, so I'm going to talk to you this morning about uh, the carbon saving potential of rainwater harvesting systems. Uh, I'm Michael Fardeth, uh, Chief Exec at Storm Saver Limited. OK, so first of all, it's important to have a look at the government targets. Uh, the government set quite strict targets last year uh, for the UK. Uh, the UK target is net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Now, these are targets set against 1990 levels. So presumably 1990 was a, a year when, uh, uh, when, when carbon levels peaked. Okay. The UK has already reduced uh, carbon emissions by 42%. Uh, much of this has come from the energy sector. Uh, the energy sorry, se Mike, sorry, you, we Hello. can't see your presentation. Oh, okay. okay can you share uh, your presentation? Yes, sorry. Uh, thank you for interrupting. Uh, I am... Um, uh, that was a schoolboy error on my part. Uh, can can you now see that? Uh, yes. That okay? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. Okay. So sorry. So just just uh, just saying then that then we've got the UK targets uh, at a net zero against 2050 uh, levels, uh, and uh, sorry, that's kind of throwing me now. Uh, the UK has already reduced uh, emissions by 42%, uh, much of which has come from the energy sector. So it, it was probably easiest to start reducing carbon levels in the energy sector uh, because that area is where we can use most, uh, mostly renewables, uh, which have come from uh, low energy sources like uh, solar and wind. Uh, and last year, 50% uh, of the energy in the grid uh, came from renewables, which is a, a really positive start. But there's a long way to go uh, to be able to hit uh, 2050 targets. Uh, you can see there uh, by percentage that water uh, makes up quite a large uh, proportion of UK emissions, uh, which is 10%. Now, we may not think of water as being a, uh, a main producer of carbon, because after all, it falls out of the sky for free, uh, and then obviously we receive it in our tap. But it does actually make up a large proportion. Uh, and I'm just going to show you now uh, how water recycling can help, uh, because we're all going to need to play our part uh, to, uh, to, to hit uh, net zero targets. OK, so this slide, uh, we, uh, we took uh, some test sites. So we, we have over 2,000 commercial sites uh, out there with live rainwater harvesting. Uh, they are nearly all commercial sites, uh, which is what we specialize in. Uh, and I've uh, taken a selection there of retail, public sector, commercial offices, education. And these are the, uh, the, this is the site information that we provided to the Ricardo uh, reports, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, normally, when a system is installed, uh, we we are helping designing at the new build stage uh, on the whole. And we would look at uh, a rainwater harvesting system to be able to provide at least 50% of the water 
uh, in a commercial application, uh, whether that's from irrigation, vehicle washing, process use, toilets, those kind of uh, non-potable uses. Uh, of course, sometimes it can be less than 50% and sometimes it can be much more. Uh, what you'll see from this slide is that uh, the green indicates the use of rainwater harvesting and the red shows the top up of mains water. If we take a mean average across those 80 sites, it shows that uh, the approximate amount of rainwater used on each site is about 4,000 cubes a year, topped up by about 600 cubes of, uh, of mains water. So what, uh, what that shows is that if we used rainwater harvesting in all new sites, we're obviously going to have some major savings in, uh, in, in uh, mains water consumption, which can only be a good thing for demand management. Uh, actually, if we looked across the 80 sites, there's 326 megalitres of water saved across those sites, which is, is quite considerable, uh, given that that is only 80 sites. OK, so we have more than enough rainfall in the UK. Uh, so, albeit that it uh, is mixed in terms of where it falls, so highest levels, of course, up in Scotland and Wales, uh, and over, of course, in, in the more drought areas of the southeast, we have much less uh, water falling. But we do have about 18 times more rainfall than the net consumption of the population. So, uh, provided that we uh, make use of collecting that uh, carefully, then there's enough to go around. Uh, so I've Taking a look at three case studies here, uh, I'm going to just talk mainly about the first one, the educational slide, uh, because if I talk through all three, uh, it, I will overrun my time. Uh, so if I look at the, uh, the, the mains water, uh, the overall use used on this school, so this was quite a large, uh, a large building, and we collected the water off of the roof. Uh, mains water on this site would have used uh, about, uh, well, it, in total, it would have used 7,600 cubes per year. Now, the carbon cost of that works out to be 2,600 kilograms a year. Now, if, if you're sort of wondering what does that kind of equate to, or you didn't perhaps realize just how much carbon comes from water, 2,600 kilograms is approximately the weight of a Range Rover each year going up into the atmosphere. So it actually is a lot of carbon going up there coming from water. Uh, we actually installed a rainwater harvesting system, uh, which uh, the meter readings showed that that saved uh, 6,400 uh, cubes of water over the year. And if we look at the carbon cost of just pumping that rainwater, that had a carbon uh, uh, amount of 381 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So it actually saved 2,262 uh, kilograms. Uh, in, in, in comparison to my Range Rover analogy, uh, the use of rainwater would have been about the equivalent of a motorbike if you wanted to kind of put them both into uh, to, to, to vehicle terms. Now, one thing about my comparison of carbon there, that is purely uh, a figure for the operation of the system and the pumping of the water on that site. If we wanted to actually look at the installed system uh, the cost of the concrete installation, the underground excavation, uh, the servicing delivery of the system in the first place. That really slews the figures uh, because obviously in the first year you have a huge spike of carbon and then much lower uh, carbon emissions over the next sort of uh, 30 years. So if we looked at it overall over 30 years, uh, which I think is a fair uh, representation of the uh, system life, uh, the, uh, the, the carbon saving works out to be about 78% on that site. Uh, so you would have used nearly 80,000 kilograms of carbon uh, if you were just using uh, mains water. Uh, if you just used rainwater uh, with the installation, you'd have used about 22,000. So it's actually major savings. Uh, on the other site, so this was a commercial uh, printing site, uh, that, that had a 58% reduction in carbon by using rainwater versus mains water. And then the retail distribution. Now, this was a really huge site. Uh, and that had a, an 86% uh, reduction. And, uh, and in terms of the amount of rainwater saved on that site, it was, uh, it was 98,000 cubes a year. So, so uh, there really are, in a commercial sense, some, uh, some, some major impacts that can be made.
Okay, so in terms of these figures, where do we get the information from? Well, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the government do produce uh, a set of figures every year uh, for carbon output. Uh, uh, Mains water hasn't actually changed uh, between 2019 figures that these are based on and 2020, so I've just left these figures. Uh, but the amount of carbon then uh, from Mains water, the government figure shows that to produce a million litres of water would give you 344 kilograms of carbon going up into the atmosphere, uh, where compared against pumped rainwater, that would only be 59 uh, kilograms per million litres. So in terms of just pumped rainwater versus mains water, where you would be pumping uh, 5.8 times uh, the amount of rainwater versus mains water. But then if we take into, uh, into, uh, into effect the installation, uh, the underground storage tank, the materials, uh, the delivery, commissioning, and then twice yearly uh, service visits, then we come up with a, a, a emissions factor of uh, 214 kilograms of carbon dioxide uh, per year for each million litres of water. And like I say, that was based on a study of 30-year uh, life of the system uh, and the mechanical life of the equipment being on 15 years. So that would need replacement pumps, et cetera, at 15 years that based on uh, what we think would be the norm. So all of the government figures, of course, are talking about net uh, zero figures based on 1990 levels. Well, it is actually possible to make anything uh, carbon neutral if we offset that carbon against something. So just as an example, I've tried to show you uh, a couple of different systems. So these are two systems based on 20,000 litres. So underground uh, rainwater harvesting systems, there's, they're much more involved. Uh, the, uh, the structure of the tank needs to be much higher because it's coping with uh, underground pressures. Uh, we've got concrete surround and concrete happens to be uh, quite an emitter of carbon during the manufacturing process. And therefore, if we look at a payback for the carbon over a 10 year period, if you wanted to offset that, you could use renewables and using a, 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 a 2019 solar panel that's uh, available for anybody on the market would take 18 solar panels over a 10 year period to offset all of the carbon from installation, from delivery and from the ongoing servicing and the energy requirements. If we look at an above ground system, it's much less involved in terms of concrete, etc. And then therefore, the, the carbon amounts from the above ground system are much less. They would only take five solar panels to give you the same 10 year payback. So it is possible to give you a carbon neutral system. And of course, using freely collected rainwater that you can collect off of your roof, uh, which is obviously quite high quality. I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to talk about that today. OK, so in terms then of uh, coming back almost to my first slide, uh, carbon, uh, or rather water, produces about 10% of the UK emissions from, uh, from carbon. Uh, rainwater harvesting on, uh, on new build sites would have the potential to uh, reduce uh, mains water uh, consumption by between 50 uh, and 75 percent. As my graph showed earlier, uh, that can be much more in many cases, depending on the size of the site, of course, and the amount of water used on site. But when combined with a renewable energy source like the solar panels, uh, Rainwater harvesting has the uh, potential to reduce uh, water carbon emissions on any new sites by about 5%. So we think that it's obviously a, a very viable uh, thing to do, as well as, of course, helping with uh, demand management for, uh, for, for water resources. Uh, so that, that is, uh, concludes my presentation today. I hope I haven't gone over time. Uh, thank you very much.
so that probably brings us um yeah to the panel discussion um so i would just um any there was a couple of questions in in the chat um that i've seen about um mythology of of, of the calculations mike but i think you kind of came, came to that later on so, you know to using the carbon factors uh, but if you want to give a you know a minute on on how we came up with the carbon numbers um, yes, okay. for the calculations. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. So I uh, so if we're talking about the uh, the, the carbon numbers, uh, if we're talking about the mains water figure, that that's an easy one because that those carbon emission figures are just uh, directly off of the uh, the government website. In terms of the rainwater harvested. Uh, Essentially, what we look at is we've looked at the pa power consumption of the unit, uh, how many hours. So, so these test sites, uh, we looked at how many hours the uh, the pumps were running, if there was any UV disinfection. Uh, we we were able to then calculate what the total energy use was. Uh, we also then had uh, have all of the specifications of all of the equipment. Uh, talking to the manufacturers, we were able to get uh, carbon. Uh, figures for all of the equipment. Uh, we used uh, standard emission factor figures for fuel, for transport, uh, from uh, from transportation companies to work out carbon from deliveries. And effectively, when you add all of this up, uh, and then you're looking at the materials for installation, etc., on site, you're able to then come up with a, a total uh, carbon uh, installation setting. Uh, which then was then divided over a period of 30 years to uh, to, to give these figures. Uh, obviously, all of them are multiplied by the amount of mains water uh, and rainwater used, therefore, to give you the correct figures. Thanks. So there was a there was another one from Stroma here. Why the difference percentage for the different types of buildings? Education uh, and commercial 70 plus, but printing only for 50 plus. Yes, OK, well, uh, the uh, the sector is a, a, a red herring there, really, uh, because really it all comes down to uh, the size of the system. So of, uh, it may well be that uh, the, the 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 printing one, which had a, a, a surprisingly, I mean, even though it was uh, was it fifty eight percent efficiency, uh, even though it had a, a an efficiency level of fifty eight percent, that that building. Uh, didn't have the same size footprint as the amount of output in terms of water used. And then therefore, obviously, it then obviously had a, a, a larger amount of mains water topping that up. So yeah. the, the sector itself is a red herring. It all comes down to the size of the roof area, the therefore the amount of water you can collect, the amount of water used by the consumer. Yeah, and it's probably pretty clear that that there's a relation between uh, rainfall patterns in certain areas, like taking the west of the country as more rainfall than the east, and then of course surface area you can collect from to the people. So London, for example, struggles probably with rainwater harvesting a little bit. If you have a high-rise 40-floor building uh, where rainwater harvesting might be, you know, in terms of percentage of coverage for yeah. the toilets, it would be it's, you would be struggling. Um, there was another question about um, toilet uh, presuming. So the, the water was mostly used for toilet flushing was the question here from Tim. Um, do you have any, do you treat it at all? Is there any bacterial virus transfer risk when flushing? I mean, that's a, or Legionnaires, that's a, you, you would, didn't want to touch on that one in the presentation, but I guess, uh, you know, we can, we can, we can, yeah, clarify us a little bit here. You want to? Oh, do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, if you want to, or. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so in terms of uh, the, the water applications, so, when, when we're looking at uh, water use, uh, we, we need to look at the bit buildings individually, uh, which we obviously do at the planning stage. Uh, so if it was a school, for example, uh, then you've got uh, young youngsters, uh, the, you don't have a full immune system until, uh, until you're approximately 16 years old. So we would recommend uh, treating the water, usually with uh, non-chemical treatment such as UV, uh, which does have a replacement uh, cost uh, every year, and, and that would be done as part of uh, routine servicing. Uh, in terms of Legionella, I mean, that's always a good question because Legionella can be uh, 
can be prevalent in any water supply, so it wouldn't matter whether it was rainwater harvested or in a mains water storage tank in uh, in your building. Uh, and then obviously there's quite strict legislation on doing testing, uh, so that that's something that we would recommend. Uh, when water is stored in underground storage tanks, uh, which uh, it is is usually the favoured uh, method of, uh, of, of uh, installing rainwater harvesting in our experience. Uh, and I guess that's because it doesn't take up car parking spaces, it's then not an obtrusive item above ground, it can't be vandalised. Uh, when you're storing water below ground, you have typical temperatures of between 5 and 11 degrees, uh, which are much lower than the temperatures that uh, Legionella likes to breed at. Legionella loves 26 degrees plus, and therefore if you're storing water above ground, you then get the water rising in temperature to the uh, to the ambient temperature it, wherever it's stored. If you've got a, a, a tank above ground outside during the summer, the water can come up to levels of Legionella. And then therefore, I would say, like with any stored water, you should have a, a, a proper procedure in place for testing the water. Uh, if it's an above ground system, uh, then I would suggest that UV treatment also is is, is is quite a, a useful thing. It, it, it's quite low cost. Uh, it, uh, so, so, so I would say that is that helpful. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think in, in maybe to just uh, finalise that, in the, the British standards have water water requirements in them. Uh, we, I was part of the discussion. In fact, I'm the chairman of the uh, the British standard uh, for water reuse. So we had the discussion about what water quality and what you have to achieve. And there are standards. The standards have water quality requirements in them. Um, and that's if you look at, want to know more about you know what you should be achieving, what can be achieved, and what at what point should you treat water a little bit further. But rainwater for toilet flushing you know, for example, wouldn't need any any further treatment in the in, normally. And uh, there's a question for Lydia coming in. Um, let's see from Sarah here, possibly a walk of question. Awkward question for Lydia. You alluded to the policy options and intervention may not be made public. Can you elaborate on that at all? Yeah, no problem. Um, so since I recorded that a couple of days ago, sort of things are changing all the time and that work should be published either today or Monday. Um, so there was two reports, one that was the cost benefit analysis that used all those, um, all that data and put it into models. And the other one was sort of aimed at target audience being the EA, um, where it looked at lots of different policy options. And as a sort of steering group, we cut those policy options down to about eight or 10, which were realistic. Um, and then we modelled what we thought the savings would be over 10 and 20 years for each of those policy options. There's a really great um, table that summarises that whole report with the policy options on one side and then the 10 and 20 year savings across commercial and domestic um, buildings. So um, I think it will be the case that it will be made public um, once it's been received by the EA and read. Um, but yeah, it will be up to them um, because they sort of partly funded the work and they were the target audience. So um, yeah. I think I'll, I'll share both of those reports if I'm able um, with Eleanor to distribute across this network um, and hopefully it'll be both both reports by the time they come out. Yeah. yeah, that's great stuff. I mean, we'll probably all be interested to see what, what the outcome is. Um, yeah, any uh, probably I haven't seen any other questions there at the moment and probably to kind of uh, wrap up at one point. Is there anything for you three uh, kind of what would you like to see? Um, if you could, you know, do a wish list. Um, anything you think we, uh, it, yeah, you wanted to see what should be happening in in England or the UK and overall. Shall I start with you, Peter? There, too, because yeah, um, I think I would, pref you know, I would like to see a more consistent approach and a a recognize a, a realization from government that you know you need to step in and to make things mandatory to really push this forward um just relying on goodwill um and good practice uh, only gets you so far and i think uh, we need to follow the lead uh, of, of wales uh, and move forward to a, a, a mandatory adoption for new new developments and to look wider as well uh, to to include more and more aspects and to really focus on water quality as well as flood risk so that would be my wish list yeah yeah, should I jump in? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've been looking at rainwater harvesting for about a year. So I, before a year ago, I didn't have any experience in it at all. Um, and it just still baffles me how much evidence is out there and how many times these kind of reports have had to have been done to continually show the benefits and the evidence and the, um, the kind of 
savings that can be made um and the more that i read and the more that i've you know when i've looked at literature reviews and things and the more that i understand um i don't understand why it hasn't been taken forward um and i think it must come down to regulators at this point um to get the building regs changed and it's i think the evidence is there surely that um it's for policymakers to take it forward from here yeah, good. Uh, just an example, in the, the internationally, there's mandatory schemes out there. Already other countries have seen the, the benefits and are using them. Yeah. Um, Mike, you want to want to do your uh, yeah, I, Well, I, I would uh, just repeat really what Lydia and Peter have just said. I think that really until there's some uh, joined up thinking from uh, government uh, and, and some legislation uh, and guidance coming through from DEFRA, then, uh, then I, I think it's unlikely that uh, developers will include uh, any type of water recycling as uh, as, as standard. Uh, the, certainly our client base comes from customers generally that have got their own environmental strategies and policies and want to be an environmental leader, but that is only a minority of the buildings that are built in the country. So I think there are uh, 10,000 planning applications uh, a, a, a year coming in over, uh, sorry, a week coming into uh, uh, in, into planning, and w obviously, as you know, lots uh, there there aren't even ten thousand installations a year of rainwater harvesting in the country, and there's no reason why uh, that these systems shouldn't be mandatory, mandatory going forwards in new buildings. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of uh, give the audience a little bit of idea, in the UK we estimate something like 5,000 systems being installed, um, you know, in domestic and commercial environment, and Germany does about 100,000, just to give you an idea, and that is yeah. even not not mandatory, okay? Um, yeah. Good. Uh, I have, there's a little bit of question here from uh, 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 Pi Picus, I think. Um, does it need to be pushed only via regulatory read, or is there be sold, can it be sold to developers as CBA? Could you get, just verify what CBA? I don't know. Maybe can, somebody can help me. The CBA, what's the cost benefit? Sorry? Cost benefit. Cost benefit. Ah, okay. Something. Okay. Um, well, the, the, see, the, when I, I might be able to jump into this one, the, the problem we're having with developers is they, they normally build to sell. OK, so, of course, for them, the benefit for them, you know, of course, is not while they're building it. They put they have the cost to put it in. The benefit is later on with it with a tenant. Um, so therefore, there's a big problem to kind of how are you going to, you know, how are you going to get them to be incentivized to put something in that they're not going to have any profit from? So I had many discussions with developers and they go to me and go on what's in for me. You know, if I'm building 3000 new homes, you know, I'm selling on I'm, you know, right away, hopefully. And then, you know, I'm, I'm just putting more money in for what? Yeah, currently it's not like people are asking for it everywhere. So the, they're just not interested. So they're, unfortunately, the, the benefits currently lie with the, with the tenants and potentially with the water companies, because of course, if we have the reductions in flows and, you know, treatment elements and less uh, helping them with the water targets, that's one thing. And the tenant, of course, has a reduced water bill, but the builder in between doesn't really get anything out of this. So that's where currently I think there needs to be financial models or, you know, support schemes where you say, okay, you, you know, if you're putting a system in, you know, that's that's where we take the money from the tenants or from whoever makes the benefit to kind of do this. Um, you know, in, in, in New York and San Francisco and, you know, for, well, they have the benefit that San Francisco Water Company is part of the city. So, of course, they are giving money to put systems in because they're going to have the benefit right away. They seeing this and they even monitor it as well. So whatever money they put in, they literally check what they're getting out of it via this performance monitoring. And the same in New York, New York City water is part of the city of New York. So the problem we are having here in the UK with privatized water companies that, of course, there's a lot of it, an element. How can you get privatized company to finance that element? You know, you know, has a the social benefit that you're having. So I think that's a that's another debate to be had. Um, you know, I'll be you know, very interested to find some financing models in that way, just to kind of get everybody, um, you know, get around the table and get it done. Yeah, is that um, are we time wise okay there, uh, Sarah and uh, and or otherwise any more questions? Yeah, I think we'll we'll have to wrap up if that's okay. Let's. I don't think yeah, any absolutely questions. fine. I think we. We're there, all questions asked, answered. And if you have, of course, more, we, all of us, 
are happy to answer more. Um, I mean, our you know if emails can be handed over. I'm pretty sure everybody's happy to receive some more questions if there are any uh, to answer more. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very Thanks, much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, thank for you. a really fantastic right. um, special session. That was amazing, and um, so many different perspectives. Um, and so many thoughts about um, how to take things forward. And certainly, um, so for those of you who don't know in the audience, my PhD in 2010 echoed many of these things. Um, so it's nice to hear that there's some new evidence, and new data that's really tackling the energy and carbon side and the cost benefit side in a more positive way. Um, and hopefully, um, as Lydia said, that can be taken forward. And um, I think Pete in the comments um, be a bit of a game changer um, in this area. So um, thank you very much indeed to the Water Reuse Technical Committee for bringing us um, such a uh, lively and timely um, call to action on resilience and integrated water management and particularly rainwater harvesting and grey water reuse. Um, and in this plenary I'd just like to summarise um, a few thoughts and themes from today, but also the, the last two days, really, for um, those that couldn't join us yesterday, because we've had some really good consistency and some really um, sort of balanced uh, themes and views across the two days. So this morning we heard from uh, Chad and Patrick around international and national um, views on water insecurity, um, hand washing, personal um, daily practices around water use um, <clears throat> and uh, water efficiency in COVID. So looking at the HYS index and how that um, had highlighted difficulties in wash washing hands around accessibility, um, but also highlighted plumbing poverty and that echoed um, very much one of the sessions yesterday, um, as Chad said, um, around water poverty and social contract with Jess Cook and uh, and thinking about um, some of the themes as well around generational shifts, um, so not just about data shifts. So we're rethinking the baseline in terms of data and averages, but also around um, hazards, um, so droughts, flooding, and how those um, shifts in reference points might affect different generations um, and might be visible to different generations. And also in the parallel sessions, we've learnt about different knowledges, um, dis different participatory aspects, different governance, different innovations and different technologies. Um, in parallel session three today, we heard about um, whole systems approaches to resilience and how we can use um, kind of overarching um, frameworks, but we always need to think about local contexts and local actions. Um, and local communities, as well as uh, different um, perspectives on, for example, the law. So looking at how uh, the doctrinal approach or the socio-legal approach to um, law and looking at water and resilience can affect um, research and practice that's, that's gathered. Um, we also heard from um, Carmen Snowden about her Sherlock Holmes, if you will, style uh, analysis of personal water use. Maybe I should say CSI, because again, generational shifts, people have different reference points. Um, and certain assumptions about daily practices, so our essential versus luxury use, and also shifts in commuting, exercise, um, and eating out, particularly across different generations. Dad, yeah, would you like to give us uh, an insight on session four, I think you were in that room. I was indeed, and there's much complementarity. Uh, in parallel session four, there was quite a lot of talk about uh, micro hydro, about uh, self supply solutions, uh, including micro hydro, which is about exploiting the water energy nexus in, in different contexts, about rainwater harvesting, also about, again, generating higher resolution data for understanding not just efficiency uh, at a high level, but at a very fine level. So thinking about water efficiencies in specific application contexts like university facilities, uh, something I'm very keen on, as, as, as many of uh, WADAF attendees will know, 
um, but also thinking about other contexts too. So we had a fascinating presentation about a very detailed study looking at fractions or contributions uh, to overall household water consumption in Sierra Leone, in Freetown. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to following that up in, in different ways. If I can pick up just a couple of high level threads that seem to join everything up, I would say that a lot of the work we're hearing about, a lot of the really passionate speakers uh, and researchers we're hearing from are exploring different aspects of um, the, the, the deconstruction of the centralized uh, monolithic water services system that, uh, that we would become used to in Europe and North America. So rainwater harvesting and the extent to which that might provide up to 50 percent of uh, household water needs marks a deconstruction of that monolithic centralized system, as does or as would cleverer use of high resolution data for command and control so-called smart type systems. I'm really excited about all of that, but I do want to perhaps bring us slightly back down to earth. In the midst of all of this, please, 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 let's not forget about equality because it is the case that often these systems which come with a price premium are only available to prestige institutions or more affluent households and householders. We need to find ways to make these sorts of gains, these water efficiencies available to everybody uh, in our societies. That's how we'll really know we're making progress. As long as we're building demonstration projects, That'll be interesting, but that's not quite where we need to be. The space we need to move into is a mainstreaming space, a space where we can't not build rainwater harvesting um, solutions, whether we're building high end residential or social housing. Uh, so I think that nexus between water and um, equality is really very important and we mustn't forget that. And I would just conclude my comments by saying I, as a water professional, I feel that we have never been more relevant. We have something to say to the really big questions of the moment. We have lots to say about the, the water health nexus through COVID-19 at every scale, but we also have a lot to say about equality. And perhaps the rest of the world might find that a little hard initially. Why would water professionals suddenly be talking about equality? But there's an equality dimension to nearly every paper I've heard today and yesterday, and I think it's up to us to bang the drums and to celebrate that and to develop that. We have so much to offer and now is the time. Thanks, Chad. I completely agree. And that's something um, if we think about the Digital Water Futures um, special session yesterday that myself and Claire were talking about in terms of different biases within um, big data, within platformatization, you know, whether it's laundry services, but also thinking about um, how the developed and developed world share different um, digital water technologies um, and in terms of accessibility, making sure that there is that equality, that inclusivity and making sure that diversity and all of those kind of things are, are embedded in everything that we do. They're not just um, a surface thing. It's it's in there. It's it's embedded. It's it's the core. So thank you for that really good summary. Um, I think if Eleanor could share some of John's illustrations from the day, we'll ask John to take us through a little bit of his learning as well. You've seen obviously his fabulous illustrations and drawings and cartoons down the side. Um, we've put a little bit of a uh, montage together um, and would just like John to have a few minutes to, to talk us through them really. Okay, thank you very much Sarah, thanks for uh, that. Hopefully you should see them in a moment. Yep, I think they're coming through John. Something's happening. It's magic. Aha, there we are. So what, what I've been doing as an illustrator is working in the background uh, this very enjoyable What If conference, and I've been annotating what the presenters have been saying, but instead of making written notes in the usual way, I've been drawing, doing what's called creative note taking. So hopefully, uh, well, I think we already have a visual record of the two days. 
uh, through a medium of cartooning. Now, obviously, you're you're going to have your own highlights and points that you as individuals will take away from the conference. Uh, but what I've done from the excellent presentations and the, the, the depth of work by the presenters has been really impressive is try to create a battery of illustrations that will act as a resource and a memory prompt for, for what's happened. So hopefully I've distilled the essence of each presenters, each presenters. And um, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think cartoons, uh, uh, gentle wry humour is a great teaching aid and can often spark further dialogue. Uh, they also lodge in the memory in a way that written notes often don't. We think we think um, in images in our in our mind's eye. Uh, so it's all been recorded. Uh, sometimes complex, difficult concepts, sensitive subjects. They're all they're all very um, diffused by using the medium of illustration and cartooning. So it's shameless self promotion, but that's what I've been doing. Uh, it is available and Elena, Eleanor has put it on the website and it's going to be in the form of storyboards and uh, slideshows and I hope it's added to your experience and you've enjoyed this what has been a fantastic what if water efficiency network conference so I'm conscious I don't want to crash into Nick's presentation which is coming up but that's what I've been doing thank you for the opportunity and I'll share my contact details uh, thank you very much Many thanks, John. That's brilliant. We will have that available as you've um, highlighted. Thanks very much indeed, John. Um, so I'd just like to hand over to um, Nick Paling now from the West Country Rivers Trust for the last session of the conference. So whether you have your lunch with you or you're dying for lunch, please do stay tuned um, and listen to um, Nick over the next few minutes. So over to Nick, um, who's going to introduce the new virtual water resilience hub. I am. Um, Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so my, what I'm watching my internet um, keenly over the last few minutes to check that it's going to be resilient and bear up to this. Um, I will check at each stage of the process, and perhaps with you, Sarah, that you can see what I'm trying to present. Um, and <clears throat> if it goes horribly wrong, then um, I accept no responsibility um, and blame my internet service provider. So um, I'm going to launch straight into this. Uh, I've got a bit of a presentation and then I'm going to just give it a go and see what happens. I am approaching this with some trepidation. Obviously, the live nature of it um, is one thing, but also the, um, the, the the resilience hub should work fine. It's, it's not that, it's the technology that's going to get it so that you can see it. Um, so let's give this a go. Right. Can you see the presentation? Somebody. We, we can. Thanks, Nick. Oh, a few. Right. So uh, very quickly, I've got a few slides that I'm going to run through just to give you a bit of background in relation to this. And then I'm going to show you the Water Resilience Hub as it currently exists. So I've called this from initial concept to virtual reality because it is a play on words because it is virtually uh, a reality and it's also um, uh, done in a virtual reality uh, situation. So we shall see. So um, in June, I'm forget my years now, it's 2020, right? So in June 2019, I, I went, I was lucky enough to go to the um, Nature for Cities conference in Paris. And um, that was right in the time when we were organising or beginning to organise the Water Resilience Summit um, that we had in September in Totnes, which I presented earlier in the in the conference. Um, and while I was at, in Paris, I met up with a group um, from the US Forestry Service, bizarrely enough, who work um, on environmental stewardship um, and grassroots, um, local food and, and environmental projects in New York City. And they told uh, me, they presented this poster that's on the left of this slide about a, a concept that they had to develop um, a community resilience hub, um, this architect designed installation in um, Manhattanville, which is a which is a real place in Manhattan. Um, and it, the, the design of it was it's an amazing space. It was a demonstration space. Um, they wanted it to be it was off the back of the WE Act, uh, which is an organization in New York's Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. Um, and they um, set about designing, collect co-designing with the community, a hub for local community issues related to climate resiliency, emergency preparedness and various other uh, things. So they wanted this pop-up 
uh, installation to be um, kind of a place where people come together to create social capital, to learn, to, to participate in workshops. Um, and they use this expression, they wanted it to be an activated public space. So this got me thinking, and I was thinking, wow, that would be amazing to do after the Water Resilience Summit to sort of continue the conversation of, from the summit. And I had a conversation with some colleagues in South Devon, and I said, what would this look like in Totnes as opposed to Manhattan? And we came up with the idea that probably the best thing would be to have a, a yurt, uh, which would be very Totnesy. Um, but in fact, um, my ideas uh, developed on from there. So I did some investigation and uh, obviously looking into the current situation in relation to these kind of mobile libraries, um, these um, some people call them community based kiosks. Um, there's the, I've discovered this uh, new, new thing in, in South Devon, the share shed a library of things and then that got us thinking about this idea of a library uh, as well as a, as a hub that sort of uh, you know a cafe these kind of social spaces where people come together to share knowledge to um to reassure each other to build social capital to to become engaged and empowered to take action in their own uh, local community other examples there are things like the solar kiosk these um, again, these sort of demonstration installations that sort of pop up in, in this case, in a climate conference where people come together to <clears throat> share their knowledge, but also to, you know, um, uh, almost just have a com create community, if you like, um, in terms of that, that having dialogue, uh, discourse, discussion, discussion, discussing the issues and so on and so forth. So obviously I thought this was going to work um, very well. And, and obviously there's other examples like the Knowledge, knowledge Cafe, um, which I, um, which I've discovered through my investigation of this stuff, which is you know shows, you know the power of this, uh, the energised nature of these and the creativity that can be engendered in these in these shared community spaces. So basically, to cut a long story short, what I decided to do was to build our own community water resilience hub, and actually in the end it took the form of a five and a half meter geodesic dome, which we launched officially at the Water Resilience Summit in September last year. Uh, and the aim of it essentially was to create a, a, a deployable asset that would allow us to take the conversation that was started at the summit out into local communities across the southwest. And in the weeks and months after the summit, the dome, uh, as it became known for obvious reasons, um, was um, we had huge take up. So we had we were we were booked to go to fairs and events and um, uh, Rattery Climate Fair and South Brent Climate Fair. Um, Totnes Arts Trail, loads of people had approached us and asked if they could have, have the dome and my colleague Josie designed the dome, restyled it as a library, as a water resilience library, um, which was, you know, this idea of a mobile library was really sort of resonating with people. So that's what we did. Um, and then obviously in February, March time, uh, just as we were about to go on the road with the dome, um, we coronavirus struck and so we were left w uh, without the opportunity to to continue the conversation so that, that that's where we made the decision to morph the dome uh, online to create a virtual covid-19 uh, resilient uh, water resilience hub and so the aim of it really was to try and capture the really sort of magical atmosphere that I felt that we created at the initiated at the water resilience summit and to take that out and really get into uh, communities across the southwest. And, and as the comment was made earlier, the Water Resilience Summit was very much had a had a an, an audience of that place in Totnes. We we didn't take the decision to have it in Totnes lightly, but um, there are a number of other communities now that we're looking to to work in uh, North Plymouth, for example, with the River Keepers project um, in Torbay with Torbay Community Development Trust and, and others, so, and in Taunton, as you've already heard in the conference about Sponge 2020. So. We really wanted to use the Resilience Hub to go out and get um, the conversation started with those much harder to reach communities. Um, I'm, what's the next slide? I'm not going to show you the next slide because what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop out of this presentation seamlessly. And what you'll discover is that actually I was giving the presentation from inside the Water Resilience Hub. Um, so I can close that. So this is the atrium of the Water Resilience Hub. Um, I can't remember if I shared my sound with this, so I, um, it will remain to be seen whether or not some of these demonstrations work, but essentially to give you a very quick guide, 
Let's just see if this plays. You might not get the sound of this. Welcome to the Community Water Resilience Hub for the Southwest. This is a freely available public resource and all are welcome. So come on in and have a good look round. You've arrived on the ground floor. This is the atrium. Here you can find all the background information about what the hub is and where it came from. Please feel free to spend a few minutes browsing the information here in the atrium. Once you've done that, the floor guide is shown to your left. Just click a link on there and the virtual lift will whisk you off to that floor. The Water Resilience Hub includes the Water Resilience Library, over two floors of inspiring and empowering information. Right, that's enough of that. Um, I'm going to show. I'm going to take you on a tour anyway. So, um, as I, if you hopefully you heard that in in the in in that introductory presentation, um, I basically mentioned the floor guide. The floor guide is here, and we can we'll go and explore some of these other floors uh, in in a moment. But obviously, the other thing I mentioned is that this is the atrium. Um, so every single bit of information in the hub has um, links associated with it, um, holding positions for other presentations and webinars. Over in this corner, um, hopefully you can see this, we have, this is the information relating to the Water Resilience Summit. So if you click on this link, um, you can access the online report from the summit, which was produced after the summit. So that's a sway um, that actually pops up there. And you can access all the presentations from the summit and all of the various other um, bits of information and there's also a couple of videos including the presentation that I presented earlier in the What If conference. Uh, over in this corner as you've already seen we've got the introduction to what the hub is and you can click link, link through to uh, information about how we built the dome and there's also other interactive images um, and bits of information presented uh, to help people get to grips with what this subject is. Um, I think that's everything from the atrium. So I'll go up to the next floor, which is floor one is relates to the natural water cycle. So we've split the we've split the always split the narrative into demand. So the natural water cycle, which provides regulates water and makes it available to us as human beings. And then the human water cycle, as I call it, which is essentially human beings uh, the bit where water is with us, essentially, and the environmental infrastructure that allows us to uh, to take the to tap into the natural water cycle, or indeed to protect ourselves from it. So this is the um, natural water cycle floor, uh, and it basically goes through a series of sections. So there's a section on weather and climate, um, giving you links and access to all the key reports. Um, and the aim of this is a is really a public, informed public audience. So. Um, only information is presented here, which is going to be interesting and engaging to um, to a, to a, a possibly an informed uh, lay audience. So you've got lots of videos, links through to um, resources such as the Met Office, what is climate change kind of stuff. Then over here we've got farmland and soils. So uh, again, not more interactive. Are they images? Maybe. No, oh, we've got a non-functioning one there. Uh, and um, various other elements here relating to groundwater, estuaries and coasts, a whole series of videos um, there. The other key thing is that we really want to make this a sort of an immersive experience so that people can ask questions at any time. Um, and we've got in the cafe, you'll see on the top floor, you'll see that we've got Ask an Expert and we've got Swap Shop and various other things. But um, it, there's an information point so anyone can sign up here, they can ask a question. It's all it's in HubSpot, so it's all GDPR compliant. Um, and yeah, so really it's just a question of people exploring. Um, I shall very quickly, I'm aware of the time, so I'll just go, we'll get, jump in the lift. So this is the Water Resilience Cafe. Um, so after the Water Resilience Summit, the Bioregional Learning Centre for South Devon actually have, um, and through the Regenerate Devon uh, group, have are about to initiate a resilience cafe which is an online sort of discussion forum place where people can meet and discuss um, but I've kind of borrowed that idea because all, all libraries need a good cafe um, and so uh, what we've got here the cafe really is where the interactivity is the greatest so you can sign up to uh, get news updates from the library and hub over in this corner We've got um, the directory of groups working on resilience. So there's a this is a work in progress, but there's a 
I'm going to have a map of the southwest showing all of the groups, um, organisations and individuals who are working to deliver a more water resilient West Country. Uh, and if there's groups that people are aware of, then they can let us know um, through that. And then over here, we've got the swap shop. So the swap shop is an idea that we've used quite a lot um, in the past, which is based on the sort of Japanese idea that, that you can trade in things other using other things other than money, other than currency. Um, so on the swap shop, we asked people, and we did this at the Water Resilience Summit, what do you need? Um, so getting people to say, I would like some help to know, to learn, to be reassured, to contribute, to participate, to take action, but also encouraging them to um, put down what they can offer in exchange for that. So I can offer help, answers, education, training, reassurance, opportunities to take action or get involved. And so we will, as the swap shop develops, and we've done this in the past in conferences, in face-to-face -face conferences, you can actually connect people together based on their, on their asks and their uh, offers. And then finally over here, based on something we did at the summit as well, which was our, we had a Q&A board, which you may have seen in my presentation, 160 uh, questions were posted during the summit. Um, and this is, we will uh, carry that on in the cafe. So ask an expert if you've got any questions or concerns or anything you want an answer to from your journey through the library, then um, you can just ping a question into us there and we will try and find the right people to answer it um, in this kind of networking mode. And then last but not least, there's a special exhibition. I should say the human water cycle floor is work, uh, still in development <laughs> and also developing a special exhibition on nature based solutions, um, which will sit next to floor one. So um, again, that it takes what can only be described as a bit of time to put these together. So um, the water type challenge is a new initiative um, under the water resilient communities sort of in initiative that we've set up recently over the last month. Um, you can sign up here to do the water site challenge um, and potentially join the sub 100 club, uh, which is an exclusive club for people who use less than 100 litres, can evidence that they use less than 100 litres of water in their house a day. Um, various other things, there will be a lot of, we've already um, uh, curating a collection of stories from people who are doing the water type challenge. And indeed you can, on the website or indeed here, you can watch some of my experiences in video, my video diary from me doing the water type challenge. So I'm doing the water type challenge the whole of August and, and September. So I'm halfway through and it's ridiculously hard um, to do. Um, and there's also going to be other links up on here to things like the water type library, which is on the water, uh, water type uh, website. So um, what else is there to say? Let's go back to the atrium. So, um, so what we've hoped, the ambition of this, what's it for? The idea is obviously to provide a resource where we can integrate a huge amount of different information in a very, very rich content in a way that you can't necessarily present it via a website or in, in any other way. It's very much intended to be a neutral space. It's not about West Country Rivers Trust. OK, we've got Pro Water um, project logos and, and banners on it because ultimately that's the project that's been funded under. But really, we want it to be a neutral space, preferably with as little of, of my face in it as possible. Um, and um, as you can appreciate, that would be valuable. And um, but also to make it available for anyone who's got messaging or resources or videos or, or um, interactive graphics or infographics that they've got that they think would be of interest to a particular audience um, who might be visiting and using a resource like this to, you know, to there's plenty of blank space in here. We could always take some of the greenery out. Um, and and so we could really, you know, put a huge amount of extra information in in here. And if so, if the offer is there. If anybody sees this and thinks, wow, it'd be really great to put our video or our link to our website or something that we've done into the Water Resilience Hub um, as a way of showcasing it. Um, if you want to be an expert, if you want to engage with the, I would, I would love it if any one of you can inv get involved in the swap shop. So look at the swap shop, look at what people are asking for. And then maybe we can use that as a way of connecting with people and offering them help and support in, in any way that we, we, all, we all try and help people in different ways. We've heard so many different people from the conference saying about how what they do could make communities uh, more water resilient. Um, you know, and that, so there's a real opportunity to connect people together, hopefully. And, and the, you know, it's a bit of a journey of exploration doing it on online, but 
I this is made in a thing called ThingLink, and it's just ridiculously fun. If it wasn't so stressful to actually put it together in in time for the conference, it is really fun to to build, and it's really fun to um, to to use. Hopefully, so it's about creating um, footfall in the library, if you like, which will be which will be the driver of success um, in that regard. And there's Again, I, I've been I've learned so much just from going through YouTube and finding videos and bits of information and and genuinely visiting the CH Water Resources Portal and and you know and I think that other people out there will be incredibly interested in some of this some of this stuff. Um, so <clears throat> so yeah, so that's um, that's what I've got so far. It's not live live at the moment because it's not quite finished but it's fully operational so I can share the link I was thinking about sharing the link early next week and then people can have a have a have a play with it and see what see what they think and obviously all feedback I mean I've just made this up so all feedback would be hugely appreciated um, and anyway if anyone wants to contribute or be involved in any way then you're you are very welcome to this is this is um uh, this is a we want this to be a sort of a commons projects West Country Rivers Trust are completely committed to um, Creative Commons so this isn't our thing this is something we've created for the people that went to the Water Resilience Summit and anyone who who, who out there who would be of that persuasion and um, and so hopefully we see it becoming richer and richer in content and, and more and more footfall uh, as it as it develops. So I now expect the usual response to me talking, which is stunned silence. So if anyone wants to break the mould and fire any questions or, or feedback, that would be much appreciated. Fantastic. Thank you, Nick. That was such a great tour around the um, virtual water resilience hub. Um, and like you say, it's a work in progress, but I think people, you know, the comments that have been coming in are wow, amazing, awesome, absolutely brilliant, fantastic. I think people can already see the potential, but also the the connection to the, the kind of building the place that you've demonstrated there throughout those um, uh, floors, not layers, but floors. Um, I put in the comments that you mentioned you'll share a link to the non live live version, as in it's not live on the web, but it's live and operational. Well, it, it's top secret, <laughs> but it is live on the web because you because thing link is automatically live on the web. So. I mean, I, there's nothing. That, there's no reason why I can't post the link in the chat now. In fact, why don't I do that? Come on, here you go. It's one, of those, <laughs> one of those moments in life where you just think. Well received by everybody. Everybody's dying to get into the atrium. A um, couple of people said, "Can we have a link? How do we find it?" Um, one question. Sorry, I can't remember who it was from, but um, the question was, "How long did it take to create a rough cost?" I think you've alluded to that, but do you want to add anything there? How long did it take to create? my whole life has been leading up to this moment no um that's being facetious um although in a way it it's taken 18 months it's taken 18 months to create um because it was from that original idea when i saw saw the water resilient the community climate resilience hub in manhattan and what they were proposing for that that was the moment when it when i started creating it the water resilience summit was always intended to be taken forward it was never going to be a one hit thing it was always the idea was always you know genuinely initiate a collaborative approach a conversation about climate adaptation and resilience in relation to water and the hub the dome the dome took me weeks to make because I had to I made that myself um, so that, um, in terms of how long did it take me to create the thing link virtual version um, um, a week but that's because I had everything. I already had everything. I already had all the links. I already knew about all the websites. I already knew about all of the stuff that's in there at the moment. What's not in there at the moment is all the stuff I don't know about. So, for example, I've learned about 100 new things over the last two days of this conference. So, and every time I watch a presentation at the conference, I think, oh, now that needs to be in there. So, the, one of the floors that hasn't been built yet is the biggest floor, which is the human water cycle, which includes is a demand side. So, demand side management, rain share. Um, the sponge town idea, you know, the, coming from sponge 2020, all of the stuff about rainwater harvesting, all of the stuff about from water wise and all those, all that work that's been done on water use and water efficiency. None of that's in there yet. So that is an opportunity for everyone to co-design that with me rather than me just sitting here and making it up myself. 
It's brilliant. Um, and I think Lydia's put in the, the comments that they'd love to have the Waterwise um, website and resources linked to it. Um, how does she do this? But I guess we can have those kind of conversations offline. People can get in contact with you and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so the key thing is go to the water um, www.watertight.community, which is a new website. That's another work in progress, by the way. Um, but so me signing up to do the Watertight Challenge, which was my own idea, was me saying enough is enough. I'm not going to sit here and tell people what to do I'm, if I'm not going to prepare to do it myself. Um, I set up the idea of the Sub 100 Club and I haven't yet managed to get into it at my own club. So everyone is encouraged to sign up to the Watertight Challenge, give it a go, put your money where your mouth is. Um, but I've learned again so much by doing that because I'm every day I'm basically looking at reading through all the Waterwise um, website stuff, reading through the Dry Project website and about drought and all this stuff because I'm trying to become kind of an expert, which I'm not in terms of in terms of water use and this stuff. So so I'm on a journey doing the Watertight Challenge. So hopefully more people will be able to go on it. Um, but you know it's really galling. You know, a colleague of mine, Simon, he said, oh, "I'll do the Watertight Challenge," and he's got a family of five living in Bude, and they use 70 liters each on average per day. Well, we were. For July this year, we were at 444, and there's only two of us. But so we were. I was like, oh my god, we're. You might want to check for leaks. <laughs> well, yeah, I have. Um, I, yeah, no, I, I won't comment about where the water use is coming from in this house. But anyway, separate conversation. Fantastic, thank you, um, Nick. I'm sure you can see in the chat that lots of people um, are contributing, and several people already having. Um, a look around. So it sounds like the main cost was your blood, sweat, and tears. Um, yeah, the cost, the cost, yeah, cost. Um, Think Thing Link is a sort of monthly subscription. It, uh, we we haven't quite got ours optimized. So there, so it, it is free. Thing Link, but to get um, you can get educational licenses for it. it Thing Link is an educational tool. Um, so you can get charity, non-profit discounts, educational licenses and stuff like that. And there's loads of upgrades and stuff. So we've got, I'm not really happy with our subscription. It's a bit messed up, but so it is a pay service for that. We'd actually to take the ThingLink logos and the branding and everything off it. Um, but it's not a huge amount of money when you consider the kind of resource and output. Because obviously it's designed for static images, the whole 360 degree virtual reality thing. The other thing, by the way, is that it doesn't just do static 360 panorama, it does 360 panorama video as well. So you can thing link videos, both normal videos and 360 videos. So you can, the idea of actually going on a walk, videoing it on 360 camera and then annotate, coming back and annotating it afterwards is, um, I mean, the power of it is I mean, I've just dipped a toe really, so I would encourage everyone to give it a go. And, and, and you can embed thing link images so that the good farm, bad farm image, which didn't work, is a thing link image embedded in the thing link um, virtual reality. Because the other thing is that you can actually have a, you can actually go in the library with a virtual reality headset. So it's, it's fully set up. You just click the virtual reality button on the bottom right hand corner and then put your headset on and you can basically explore the library in virtual reality. How mad is that? It's fantastic and the, it sounds like the possibilities are literally endless and just as long as there's creativity and imaginative thinking, you know, things and the, come and up. And as I say, the key, the key final takeaway is obviously I would advise you against going into the library in virtual reality because of the prevalence of my face at the moment. I didn't, I couldn't find anyone else to record any of the videos, so there is a bit too much me in there. Um, so yeah, anyone else who wants to record videos or webinars or short talks about you know any any of this stuff, even the talks from the conference and stuff, you know, we can put all that in the library basically. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, so I think everybody's had a wonderful tour around. Thanks to Nick, um, seeing the possibilities. Um, obviously, it springboards off lots of different things that we've talked about over the course of the conference. Um, so that brings me seamlessly into the short closing um, session for the conference. Um, I'm not sure if we have a background slide, Eleanor, that could come up or Kemi, um, just so people have a holding. There we are, I think we have it coming. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. So it just remains really to say a massive thanks to everybody, um, to the local organising committee, 
to uh, my co-chair Chad, to the chair um, session chairs, so um, Tanti Stromer, Kieran Deepak, for all of the um, panelists, presenters, keynote conversationalists, special session conveners um, and participants, and also to the fantastic delegates and participants that have made this conference so engaging, so interactive. So many questions, comments, thoughts, chats coming through. John's wonderful illustrations. Thank you so much, John, for providing those. I think they've tickled lots of people across the two days. Um, and certainly everybody's going to go and have a look at those on the website, um, along with the um, virtual water community resilient hub. So I'd just like to give massive thanks um, finally um, from everyone involved in the water efficiency network to Kemi and Eleanor of course and previously Susie who was obviously involved in water for a number of years. Um, you've been driving um, water efficiency network and the water efficiency network conference all these years and it's been absolutely wonderful to be um, uh, a member and a participant and um, be involved with everything. So I'd just like to hand over to Chad for any additional thanks and then Chad, if you could hand over to Kemi, that would be wonderful. I would just like to um, echo all of the uh, the expressions of gratitude that uh, Sarah has, has just offered and perhaps double down on uh, the, the gratitude that we have for Kemi and Eleanor in particular. Um, I've we've all been involved in a number of online events, workshops, conferences over the last several months, uh, and this has been particularly smooth, particularly uh, easy, and that's really down to Kemi and Eleanor. So huge thanks to you both. Um, I think you're well ahead of the curve in terms of helping us adapt to this new normal, um, and uh, <clears throat> I look forward to to whatever comes next in uh, in the WATF and post WATF journey. Kemi, do you have any final comments for the conference? Thank you, I do. And I do apologise because I like to do uh, a, a lengthy thank you. So I will try to be very quick. Uh, it's been a fantastic two days of conversations and debates and good camaraderie, actually. I like the chats. I've been giggling away to myself all day. It's been fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for that. I'd like to thank all the guest speakers, Jess Cook, Ian Gifford, Claire Hullen, uh, Patrick Bomer, Lutz Jordan, Mike Farnsworth, Peter Henley, Media Making, and Nick Palin, who has just blown us away with his virtual resilience hub. Uh, thank you to everybody that supported the conference, the, organi uh, the organizations, especially DEFRA, WaterWise, Bristol Water, everybody that supported us for this conference and in previous conferences as well. Uh, our local organising committee at UWE, everybody there were fantastic. Uh, session chairs, Struma Cole, Deepak Gopinath, Kiran Toto Maharaj and Tanti Octavianti. You were brilliant with the sessions and keeping us on track. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our wonderful conference chairs, Chad and Sarah. Um, I've known both of them for many years and they've always been very supportive. Uh, you were great in embracing the challenge of um, organising this year's conference. Um, we didn't know what by January, uh, February, we didn't know what we we're going to do, but it's turned out brilliant. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, thank you to John for his um, illustrations. Alan Houston, our tech guy, who's working behind the scenes. Thanks. And of course, to Eleanor. Um, I can't run the uh, network without Eleanor, and she's finishing in this September uh, to start our PhD. So I wish I a successful academic career. You'll be hearing from Charlotte, who's going to try to take over and make sense of it all. Um, so all the best to both of them. The network has had a good run, really, and mostly not because of me. I know everybody mentions my name, but it's because of everybody who's been uh, working with us over the many, many years, uh, all the network members around the world, all the past conference chairs, all the event organisers and hosts, subject leads, trip organisers, technical committee chairs, all the regulators that funded us, giving us money, organisations that sponsored us, 
Um, there are too many of them. Uh, some of you are listening and I really, really want to say a very big thank you to everybody. This is not the end. We'll be more, we'll be around in one shape or form, one of which is to continue the water efficiency, water efficiency conferences, the biannual conferences. Um, so we'll try to do that. And if you'd like to host the next one, do get in touch. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you for all your contributions. Thank you to all the speakers as well. Um, lots of interesting research going on, and it's really good to hear them all in one place. It's like my two years CPD is well and truly done. So that's it from me. Thank you, everybody, and um, see you soon. Sarah. Thank you, Kemi. So um, it's leaves me with just one thing to say, and that's many thanks again for all your contributions. Um, and I'd like to draw the conference um, to a close for 2020. Have a great lunch and a good afternoon, everybody.